Have you heard about Global Poker? Global Poker is the fastest growing card room in the US today, and it's available online at globalpoker.com. Global Poker is a social poker site that offers safe and secure cash out options by using their unique and patented sweepstakes model. Players can compete in big guaranteed tournaments, jackpot sit and goes, or cash games featuring Hold'em, Omaha, and even Crazy Pineapple. Don't wait. Check out Global Poker today. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome back to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 67, and it features Adam Friedman. Now, you'll most likely recognize Adam from the coverage he got from ESPN during the 2005 World Series of Poker main event. Uh, That was the tournament that kickstarted his career and also put about a quarter of a million dollars in his bankroll. Last week, however, Adam earned a bunch of attention from the poker world when he successfully defended his title in the prestigious $10,000 buy-in Dealer's Choice event. That's right, he won the event in 2018 for 293k, and this year, he came right back and did it again, this time earning 312000 It was his third bracelet overall, but after winning, Adam said that the back-to-back titles were only the second biggest poker accomplishment of his career, the first being that he has never gone broke. He told reporters, quote, Accomplishments are nice, but like I said, at the end of the day, it's just about being able to build a foundation, build enough stake, and being able to take care of myself, end quote. And that's another reason why I wanted to talk to Adam on the podcast. Back when he was just 23 and earning his first big score, his father basically forced him to start saving for his future. It's an idea he has kept with him throughout his career, and as a result, he won't be feeling the same sort of pressure that many other top players might be dealing with as they approach retirement age. Simply put, Adam is one of those poker pros who really has his shit together. Now, Adam was a little bit reluctant to come on the podcast, and he didn't think we would even be able to fill an hour, but by the time we were all done, we had already talked for an hour and a half. And I'm pretty sure only about five minutes of that was about college sports. Anyway, that's enough intro. Here's my conversation with Adam Friedman. There you go. Uh, I am here with Adam Friedman. Adam, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. And yourself? I'm doing good. It's an off day for you. Uh, is that a rarity for you at the World Series of Poker? Uh, I've been trying to take a few more off days uh, uh, during the World Series the last few years. Uh, uh, something just... you. Know, it's so it's hard to get no good sleeping pattern uh, occasionally uh, while you're uh, in Vegas. You just you need off days just in order to make sure you get back to you're playing your absolute best. Uh, it, it, I don't know many people that can play 50, 50 straight days of mm-hmm. eight to 14, 15 hour days between tournaments and cash games, uh, and being at their absolute prime peak. So uh, we said today's not necessarily an off day yet. It's early in the <laughs> afternoon. It might be. Uh, might be headed down to Bellagio afterwards, see what's going on down there. Okay, okay. Uh, you've been coming to the World Series since 2005? Yeah, this is my 15th year, 14th full year altogether. So you got to be good at it by now, right? Like, you know, you're not jet-lagged from those uh, Ohio uh, time zones or... I mean, how one to find... Do you stay in a hotel or you in a ho- or you rent a house or what do you do? Uh, I got an Airbnb for myself this year. I've got a buddy who stayed, who stayed with me at the beginning and he's coming back in a week from now or so mm-hmm. uh, for about two weeks for the main event and a couple other side events. It is so crucial to have the right roommate during a series. Uh, I've heard from people who've uh, tilted away their entire summer because of a bad roommate situation. Which you don't even think about, like when when it comes down to the cards and, or something like that. It's yeah, it's incredibly important if you're going to be living with uh, not just by yourself, but with at least one either one other person or several other people. You need to get along with all everybody. There can't be any drama. You want to keep things fun, jive well. When things are uh, running bad, you want know, it's, it's, you want someone to be able to talk, you know, occasionally talk things off. Not necessarily even hands, just to just to get rid of the oh my god, when is this going to end? <laughs> it just you know, you know, a few minutes later. On know. the flip side though, it would probably be pretty bad to be with like a, a two-time bracelet winner that summer when you're just offering everything as well. 
your roommate's running like God and you're just like sitting there. When is it going to start for me? I, I mean, I've, uh, I, I haven't, it's weird over the years. I, I stay with a group of guys who I really don't keep in contact with anymore for four or five years in the late, in the late aughts to about 2009 or so or 10. Uh, and then, uh, over the years, I've, a couple of years I've stayed by myself and then sometimes I've stayed with a couple of friends from back home. Uh, this year I'm staying with my, like, I'm staying with my buddy from, uh, Colorado out here. And, uh, I, I mix it up occasionally here and there in terms of whether I stay with, uh, myself, one person or, uh. I think one year I stayed with uh, four or five guys. Uh, throw up frat house. <laughs> Not really. I'll, 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 a very I'll, calm I'll frat house. This, I'll put it this way. I, I'm the loud one of the group, so, and, and, and I'm nowhere near what I used to be uh, in my 20s. So uh, if I'm the loud one of the group, it's, it's definitely a quiet house. Well, we'll get to your 20s, but let's start with uh, the single digits first. Gahana, Ohio. Gahana. Gah- Gahana. I always say Gahana. No, no, that's what most people do. Gahana, Ohio. Uh, Ohio. Tell me about uh, this suburb of Columbus. It's uh, on the east side of Columbus. Uh, moved there from Columbus when I was uh, nine, I believe, in 1991. Oh, where uh, were you born? Uh, in Columbus, in Columbus itself. Oh, okay. okay. Just, just <laughs> it's a short move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, it, it, it took the long 10, Columbus had the drive. hospital. Yeah, it took the long 10, 15-minute <laughs> drive uh, to Gahanna. Uh, it was just a typical upbringing, nothing uh, in particular. Just you know, grew up in the suburbs. Uh mm-hmm. You know, didn't really know poker. Uh, didn't really know poker existed all that much. Uh, Dad was a lawyer. He was a lawyer for about thirty six years, I believe. My mom was a teacher for thirty thirty one years. Mm-hmm. Uh, once she got her thirty years in, she was out the door immediately. She's <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> it's like, let me take my uh, X amount I'm getting for the rest of my life. I'm good to go. Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah. what were you getting into as a kid? Uh, I, I, I mean, I was always into sports. Always loved watch. I probably loved watching sports more more than I enjoyed playing them. Although my the one sport I played all the time growing up was tennis. Mm-hmm. Loved playing tennis. Uh, it was probably more just it was like the probably back probably back when I was younger. I much it was much more dependent. I like it, it was something you could rely on yourself. You know, if like, if you were in a team sport, if you screwed up, you could get the blame of someone else. You, you tried not to blame someone, but sometimes <laughs> it's hard not to when yeah. you were young. But I like the idea that tennis was always on you. Somebody uh, always makes the last out in baseball. Exactly. You know what I mean? Tennis, it's tennis, all on you. If you. Yeah, if you lose, it's on you. Uh, I mean, maybe a lucky neck court here and there could decide a match. I mean, freaky things like that happen uh, all the time. But Does that know, mean you didn't like doubles? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I played it, but I was, never the, I was never the biggest doubles fan. Are you going to play in the tag team event at the World Series? I'm trying to find someone on my fantasy. I, I just, it's funny <laughs> you say that. I just texted my fan, my uh, my 25K team uh, today. I said, is uh, anybody going to play that? Because uh, I can only play 2% of the tournament. Because oh. uh, I'll be, uh, I th- I'm pretty certain at this point I'm going to be playing the 50k mm-hmm. uh, this Monday for the third time. So, uh, yeah, I've told somebody if someone's willing to play 98 percent of the tournament, yeah, we, we're 50 50 partners. You got you. I'll be your big. I'll be the biggest cheerleader you've ever had. There you go. Well, hopefully you find a good partner who can come through for you there. Uh, okay, so you're in Ohio. You're playing tennis. Mom is teaching. Uh, dad's lawyering. And uh, school going well? Are you a, are you a studious person? I mean, uh, I, I no. imagine the pressure was intense. Uh, no, not in the least bit. Uh, I, I had a. I remember having an interaction with somebody my freshman year in high school. Uh, someone who had a four point. And I, I know things are much different nowadays. Uh, twenty twenty five years later, mm-hmm. but I remember having an, uh, an interaction with someone who had a four point oh GPA, captain of a couple different clubs activities. Literally, the most, this is the person you want to hire for everything. It does everything. Yeah. Cap, captain of multiple activities in a few sports. But, uh, you know, had a, had a good but not an outstanding SAT. Uh, like, I think it was like 11, 20, 11, 40, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Careful. I'm, I'm sitting across. Well, I, well, 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 well no, no, <laughs> no. it's okay. No, I beat no, that no, barely. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, it, it's, it's a good, but obviously in terms of what, you know, the Harvards and Yales are of looking course, for. Of course, of course, yeah. Uh, but like I said, back, back then, over 20 years ago, there was so much more emphasis on the SAT and the ACT. Mm-hmm. And I remember asking, I said, wow, I mean, I mean, everything, I mean, you must be getting into some of the best schools in the country. He got rejected from every Ivy League school, uh, every other top line school you can come up with, MIT, mm-hmm. uh, Stanford. I'm like, this is, and I remember thinking to myself, this person is doing all of this and he's getting rejected strictly because of one one test. There sh- and I remember thinking there's no way there should be this uh, uh, this kind of pressure. All of this on one test is going to find as if you have a chance to get into the absolute maybe top 10, 15 schools in the country. So did that make you like not even? Oh, try? I stopped caring. I stopped caring when I heard yeah. that. I'm like, what's going to be the point? And if I'm going to if I'm going to get rejected, I mean, I, I'm in a, you know, I, I'm a, I'm in a pretty good suburb overall. It's not like I've got. It's not like I'm uh, some sort of minority that you know maybe uh, people are looking for. 
uh, in terms of, oh, we got to fill this quota out uh, yeah. in terms of getting an accepted in the Dartmouth or, or uh, Brown. So it's like, I and mean, I'm never going to get us. I know I'm never going to get a 1600 on the SAT anytime soon. <laughs> so basically, back then I said, my philosophy is, oh, you know what? I'm just going to do really good on the SAT. I'm going to do really good on the SAT. Mm-hmm. My math is going to be excellent. My verbal should be a little above average at yeah. the time. Ironically, it'd be the exact opposite. Now, I think my verbal would be phenomenal. My math has probably gone down the tubes a little bit. but It's not a point for poker. No, it, it's, 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 it's not. It's not. It's, it's beyond it, the basic. It, it, you know, it, it's all about white magic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you you just got to feel the card Yeah, coming. if you have white magic, you, you don't need math. Exactly. So, <coughs> so yeah, at, so I, at the time, I just I more or less went through the motions. Didn't really, I didn't really care. I probably had a... Th- 3.0, if I were to guess back, well, if I remember correctly. Well, that's pretty good for going through the motions. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I just did the bare minimum. So what was the plan getting out of there? Uh, eventually, at the time, uh, was to, to get into a, go to a good school with a good business school. Uh, and, at the t- and at the time, Indiana was a top 10 business school. It was about a little less than a four-hour drive from home, so it was far away but not close enough uh, to where nobody can see what I'm doing. This was uh, uh, you were Hoosier. Yeah, and uh, like like I say on my Twitter handle, I'm a Buckeye by birth, but a Hoosier by girth. Mm-hmm. Still a diehard Buckeye fan. Mm-hmm. Ohio State football will always be number one for me. Uh, Indiana football. It's not is, quite as bad as going to Michigan. Oh God! Well, why would anybody want to go? <laughs> why would anybody want to go to uh, uh, that you know that team up north? I mean, what just unless you just unless you just want just tragedy and just tragic in your life all the time? It's just. You know, Mike, Sax- Mike Sexton sat in that, exact- mm-hmm. in that same chair and said the exact same thing. So <laughs> Mike Sexton is a very wise man. Yeah, he, there you he, go. He, know, he knows. He knows. What's, he knows uh, what's up with that with that school. I mean, I mean, it's 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 it's, it's deep down. It's where the devil lies. We all know that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so IU. Yeah, uh, Indiana. Well, yeah. So I I ended up choosing. Actually, it really came down to Indiana, Miami, uh, Ohio for me. But it came down to Indiana for a few reasons. One. Uh, my high school send, sends more people to uh, Ohio State than anywhere else, and I just didn't want to repeat a high school. I wanted to be meet, meet new people, new experiences. Mm-hmm. Uh, I still wanted to go to a pretty big school, which Indiana has over thirty thousand, which is plenty. I had a top ten business school, and I knew also it had it was a really big party school at the time. Uh, uh, in fact, I like to take credit for us being the number one party school in America our, our sophomore year in college. Were you I like guys? To take full uh, for I, that. I feel like. Uh... You made a run in basketball around that time too. You had uh, that yeah. guy with the big afro. Yeah, a uh, Jared uh, Jared Jeffries. Uh, here, 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 speaking you of, you guys tra- were like a, a a high seed in the tournament too, and you well, still made it to the final four. Speaking of tragic stories, here's a good story. So, uh, well, for first off, well, we were uh, Indiana was a five seed in the tournament that year. Duke was the number; they were the overall number one seed in the mm-hmm. tournament. Uh, we were down the entire game, down by as much as seventeen or nineteen. Indiana somehow comes back, and we take the lead with a couple minutes to go in the game, and then. We're up by four. Duke puts up a three. Jay Williams, uh, who ended up being, who NBA career got, sh- got cut short because of a car accident, hits a three pointer. We foul them. The entire place just goes, "Oh my God, this can't be happening." <laughs> they miss the free throw. Boozer doesn't get the uh, layup, and we end up winning the game. Everyone storms uh, across campus to meet and say we're number one and all that stuff. So eventually, we beat Kent State in the Elite Eight to go to the Final Four. And anybody who had season tickets, there was uh, the following day. We're going to be calling your. Uh, and, and very few people had cell phones at the time. So, uh, I, in fact, I don't, I don't think I had my cell phone until my junior year in college. Uh, that's really when things – I think sophomore and junior is when people really started getting cell phones. Mm-hmm. So I really didn't have one until I was 20. So uh, they said, we're going to call between, I believe it was like 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. or 8 a.m. and 11 a.m., something like that. On Tuesday. Like your dorm room phone? Yeah. <laughs> and everyone – and uh, basically every, no, everyone's skipping their classes, anyone that had season tickets. So I was like, well, let's see. I'm not going to my 930 class. Let me just go up the night before. So of course I, uh, <laughs> at uh, 20 years old, uh, I had a, a few uh, beverages um, that one is not supposed to have until you're 21. Sorry, <laughs> uh, well more than a few I might have had. So I remember I got back around 1:32 in the morning, and I'm pretty certain to this day I never, I never in four years I never got a phone call between 8 a.m. and noon in my in my entire life. I'm sure I probably got a few in that four-year stretch. I just don't recall them. My phone's. I made a point to keep my phone by my bed. Mm-hmm. I kept it on the other side of the room. <laughs> I hear I hear the phone go off around eight forty nine o'clock, and I've got a pretty bad hangover. And I'm like, Ugh, I'm not getting out of bed. So oh, I'm still brutal. to this day. It's, I'm still ninety nine point nine percent certain. I was getting two tickets to go to Atlanta. Yeah. But truth is, it might have worked out better because I, uh, I, there are very few weird, bad things I've done in my life. I sort of made promises with a few other people because I wanted to go mm-hmm. that if they called you. So it was probably better off I didn't uh, answer the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's what it was. It was, it was, it would have been really cool to go on. And, uh, 
a nice return. I, th- I think I probably would have been like, Mom, Dad, I need to borrow money when I after I work, when I work this summer. I'll give you the money back. I didn't but, go. Uh, my Gators were good when I was in college. You know, obviously ugh. two back to back titles, and I did not go. Uh, to any of them, and I regret it big time because you know who yeah. knows when you're going to get that shot again. Unfo- <coughs> yeah, unfortunately, like I said, as a diehard Buckeye fan, uh, I went to the game in the desert uh, in uh, 2007. Uh, my dad and I and a bunch of people took a party bus down from Vegas. Was, oh, for football, cer- you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, it was a certainty. Yeah, it's a certainty in football. We were going to be. Yeah, Ted There's Ginn no runs doubt. it back. Ted Ginn runs. I hugged 15, 20 different strangers, people I'd never seen before, <laughs> and obviously never seen since. Like this is just like the season. Remember, the Florida, season ever. Florida backed into that game. You shouldn't have been in the because I mean, it was supposed to be. You wanted to be the best team. There's no question of being the best yeah, team. Yeah, but it was supposed but to be not a the, rematch. It should have been. Yeah. As my, and, and, and as much as I can't stand that school enough, I'm the first to admit. That, and they ended up losing the USC pretty badly in the Rose Bowl. Exactly. But in terms, if it's supposed to match the two most deserving teams in the national title game, it was those two teams. We were supposed to be number three, but they didn't want to put. They two Big Ten schools against each other. But again. truth, if they really want, if they really, it really would have been smart. Imagine the biggest rivalry in all of sports, mm-hmm. bigger than the Yankees Red Sox, uh, whatever you want, whatever you want to define it, uh, bigger than uh, Barcelona. The problem Madrid. happens when it, it happened in uh, when they did that in the SEC with LSU and Alabama. Well, that was that, well, when, two things. When that, was, s- that was four or five years later. Yeah. Um, uh, those definitely were the two best teams in the country that year. That uh, those at Alabama, right? But defense, I think the game the was like a twelve nine championship game or something like 21 that. Twenty one nothing. So, uh, it was actually twenty one nothing. Seven field goals for Alabama. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. In fact, the regular season game, I still and I'm a big college football uh, mm-hmm. nut, as you can tell. <laughs> two months prior to that, the game was down in uh, uh, in uh, not Baton Rouge. In, uh, where does Alabama play at? Uh, in Tuscaloosa. Tuscaloosa. Yeah. Uh, the game went to overtime. I remember and. Uh, uh, Alabama missed a, f- a chip shot field goal. They had, they've always had terrible field goal kickers mm-hmm. for whatever reason. Why why Saban can't recruit a field goal kicker is beyond me. <laughs> but yeah, it's not in the budget. They, they missed a, they missed a chip <laughs> shot field goal, and then the LSU running back like on the first play runs like 17, 18 yards, and they set up a twenty two yarder. And I still remember the kicker running across the, the center of the field, uh, uh, telling the Alabama fans just to hush down a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> you, you guys just. Got beaten. But that's why no one wants to see a rematch. Anyway, I thought we were going to lose. I, 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 I Ted Ginn runs back the did. opening kickoff for a Florida touchdown. Florida fans never felt they were going to win. We never thought so. Uh, I was with 15 Florida fans. None of us thought we were going to win. We were like, oh, it's nice to be here. Yeah. You know? Oh, and Michigan lost? Well, maybe uh, maybe they're not as good yeah. as we thought. Maybe it could be competitive. Yeah. And then I'll... <laughs> I'll tell you, but you know, it's when they look. Do you back, want to talk about Greg Oden too? When, I mean, we, I could bring up a lot of pain for you. No, I'll, I'll, we can't. Well, we'll, we'll get to, we'll, we can get to Greg Oden here in a few minutes. But truth <laughs> is, you, you look back, you look back at that Ohio State, you know, the, the game of the century yeah. when we beat them forty-one to thirty-nine or forty-one thirty-eight or forty-one thirty-nine. I'm drawing a blank. Mm-hmm. You could start seeing holes when you look back at that game. How 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 badly both defenses got exposed in that game. Uh, it wasn't necessarily just the offenses just being great. There were way too many holes. Michigan exposed way too many holes of Ohio State in that game. And but if it's, you just don't think that Ohio State just dominated all year. Troy Smith was just flawless for 12, 12, 13 games. I mean, who played better than that for 12, 13 games? A complete leader. Uh, maybe didn't have the biggest arm in the world. He or just whatever. didn't have the height for the NFL too. Of course, yeah. I mean, you know, he was in the league for about five years or so. But you know, in terms, of, he's what you want in a leader. He's vocal, but he knows when to, you know, he knows when to keep quiet. He's everything you want in terms of a leader and a captain. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't go into football. <laughs> I, I, I think I know more uh, about my share of football than the average person. Most people are just rooting for the teams. They don't really even know. What I could see watching. you on ESPN breaking down a. Th- that's what I. That's why a, sc- a scouting is, combine. Initially, I will say when I was 12, 13 years old, I did want to go to Syracuse to uh, follow in the footsteps of Bob Costas, Marv Albert, and mm-hmm. uh, basically every other uh, sports announcer uh, that's ever existed. Uh, they worked for ESPN, uh, but yeah, I initially. Uh, you know, you look back at the game and you just don't see these holes, and all of a sudden, well, oops, yeah. we're seeing it. And I'll tell you, the, the telltale sign of that national title game was when Ohio State had fourth and two on their own 28, and Jim Tressel, the most conservative the most conservative coach of all time, he <laughs> goes for it in the second quarter down by 14 because he knows they can't stop Florida. That told you, I told you everything you had to know. I remember being surprised by that. Yeah. But he was smart. I mean, he was smart enough to realize, wow, we're just drawing dead. <laughs> and then two months ago, and then two months later, I mean, you guys were uh, – you guys were fantastic. You were the returning national champions in basketball. You returned the same starting five. Uh, I was very spoiled in college. Yeah, you, you guys were expected to repeat, and you did. I mean, I mean, I've been watching college basketball since '91. I still think the the team that repeated Florida is a top five, six, seven team I've seen in the last twenty seven years. To me, the best team is still the Las Vegas team that didn't win the national title mm-hmm. uh, in '91. When Duke, oh, the UNLV Rebels yeah, team, yeah, when the UNLV got absolutely jobbed by the referees on multiple occasions in that game. They called a terrible charge for uh, uh, the point guard, uh, like not Stacey Ogman, uh, Greg Anthony, mm-hmm. uh, who now uh, works for uh, I forget which network. 
He got a terrible TNT fifth call. Or? Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think it's TNT. He got a terrible, they called a terrible fifth call with four minutes left. That changed the last four minutes of that Duke game. Yeah. And that was it. Uh, but yeah, I thought that Duke, Duke, that Duke that uh, I'm sorry, not that Duke team, but uh, your your Gators. That was probably a top six, seven team I've seen the last. We were spoiled. Years. I mean, like like when Corey Brewer is like your fourth option. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I told people it's one of my four. I, I think it was either Randy or another F Florida Gator fan. One of our mutual friends, Randy O. Says, "Oh, that team would have." You know, it's like the best team ever. And I'm watching last year. I'm like, did you not watch Villanova last year? <laughs> that Villanova team, I think last year is the best team I've seen since Vegas. Yeah, that Nova team, I think, would crush you guys. They were pretty strong. I mean, well, I mean, we'll see how what those players the, do in the NBA. But well, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, do you bet sports? Do you, not, you seem I, like you're too much of a fan to bet sports. I bet. I, I uh, made promises to my dad years ago uh, never to bet sports, and other than maybe betting the occasional dinner bet. Uh, or maybe just twenty dollars, just killing time with a buddy of mine from back home who's got nothing to do with poker or gambling. Just a way to kill time for two, three hours. Maybe I'll do that. Was this due to your dad's conservative nature uh, um, in general, not con- or not specifically? Conserv- he's just he, uh, he's told me nightmares. He says nobody can beat sports betting. Nobody ever has. You're not going to be the first. He says, he's told me about doctor. He's told me stories uh, for another day. We can talk about doctors, judges, lawyers. Losing every penny they had to sports betting. Yeah, you know, smart guys who thought they could beat sports betting. But they occasionally can't. you hear of a line that seems off, right? And you, being knowledgeable about sports and a gambler, are not tempted at all. I'll tell you this. Um, so I made my first maybe legitimate bet about a year and a half ago. Uh, nothing, but like, like we're talking three hundred dollars. Nothing's. Uh, I follow tennis as much as anything. Uh, the French Open usually takes place during uh, uh, the World Series of Poker. And I'm always looking at the lines for the men's and women's. And I saw a line that I thought was so that I thought was one of the worst lines I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, G- uh, Gabrina Muguruza, uh, who whipped Serena in the Wimbledon the year before, and uh, previously won the French Open. Uh, she was going against Maria Sharapova, who I still believe is the most overrated tennis player of all time. Uh, they were playing each other in the round. Sorry, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> She's Sorry. a big fan of the podcast. Uh, of course. Oh, oh, she, oh my, my Maria, next time I see you, I'll apologize. I'll buy you a drink. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'm, I'll, I'll be very, I'll make it all up to you. So uh, I saw the line, and I pers- before that, I remember thinking, I always try to guess what I think the line should be. I per- I personally made uh, Garbina about a minus 220, minus 230, maybe minus 250. I thought she was going to blow her out. Mm-hmm. She came out minus 125. I'm like, this has to be a misquote. I mean, because the beauty thing is when you when you when you thoroughly believe someone's overrated, they get such an inflated line, especially in a sport like tennis. Like there's no way. This, and all of a sudden, I was staying near South Point last year, and I just went there and just look at the line, like wow, this is amazing. Yeah. So yeah, I just eh, whatever. So I bet three hundred on it, and this like a day and a half like in advance. It was literally right after the line came out. So I, I remember playing at Bellagio the following day, and uh, one of the guys who I play cards with in L.A. He says uh, he knows I'm a big tennis fan. He says, "What do you think's going on?" He says, he "says." I'm not going to say I don't want to say I don't want to throw certain names out there. I said, you're not going to believe this. It's like, I, uh, yeah, I'm like, I really like Margaret Rosa. I said, I mean, you sure? I'm like, but you never bet. So I pull out the, the, I pull out the betting thing from my wallet. He doesn't wait till his big blind. Strictly just the idea of it. He ran to the sports book <laughs> and bets like 2500 to 3000 strictly because I bet it. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm like. That's a seal of approval right yeah, there. Yeah, that tells you everything. Adam's the fact, the fact that it. I, yeah, I jumped on it. Uh, I remember the following night. I remember I was thinking more about him than uh, myself. But I saw. I went to bed. I didn't. I had no worries about this match. I wake up the following day. I see the uh, the result. Of my phone was like six two six one. Mm-hmm. Like there's no doubt in my mind she was going to win. Of course, there's no such thing as a certainty in sports. We've learned that throughout the years. Of course. But I felt incredibly. I mean, I got such the best of the line. And also, you know, it's not the outcome, right? It's it's the good decision that you made by betting it. That's what a gambler will tell you, right? Yeah, don't, I guess. Yeah, don't be results oriented. Of course. Well, unfortunately, that's well, like I said, it's, <laughs> I'm not going to put. Like I said, I wasn't going to put too much stock into that bet. But yeah, it's, it was just it was zero doubt. I had zero doubts in my mind. Of, I got such the best of this line. It's like <laughs> it's scary. Uh, All right. Well, then tell me when did poker come into the mix? All right. Well, um, I knew my, my dad played poker off and on uh, occasionally when I was younger, so I knew he played. But like I, a lawyer uh, game? Uh, and then just played with friends. Uh, all different sorts of professions, um, but yeah, you know, I didn't really know or ask too many questions about it. But uh, no different than how a lot of other people saw rounders uh, when I was about probably eighteen or so. Uh, and then once the World Poker Tour, the World Series started to come on TV, started playing with some friends in college. Um, some people who I'm still friends with to this day. Did you uh, win in your first with. session? Yeah, I I always be my friends in uh, college, uh, and but I was a very as. You can see from some of my earlier tapes, I was very emotional back then. Like, if I lost the pot, I would just lose it. Like, mm-hmm. I just can't. I don't know. 
I don't even know where this came from. I never had that growing up in anything else I did. Somehow poker brought something out in me that I didn't even know existed. Wait, you weren't like an emotional video gamer or no. when, when you uh, double faulted in tennis, you didn't well, slam yeah, a racket. Well, that's not true. I, would get, I, sh- I shouldn't say that. Actually, thinking about it now, yeah, I would, get, I, would, I would get really upset with myself in tennis now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, All right, so it's fair to say you're competitive. I get, yeah, yeah. I, actually, you know, I, I think that I, I should think that. I get, it's amazing when you start thinking back. Like, I don't think I was. Oh yeah, maybe I was that, that way. Yeah, no, actually, I'm not I still about, see a 15 year old in the mirror. So you know. Yeah, uh, uh, don't we all? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's. Uh, I, I, you know, we're just talking. I'm 37 now. How did how did that happen? Yeah. I, I, wasn't I just 14 two days ago? Exactly. I, mean, I don't think I look any different in the, in the mirror. <laughs> and then until you see some old picture of yourself, wow, yeah. that's you. Who knew? Yeah, but uh, yeah. So I, but uh, yeah, I, I, I almost always wanted to play with my friends in college, and I just thought I had to do more of the fact that they sucked, and not necessarily because I was any good. Okay, that's uh, that's what I was gonna ask because yeah. you're obviously uh, you came to Vegas with confidence, and there, there's people when they make their first trip to Vegas, I think some are like, oh, I'm hot shit, I've beaten everyone, it's just gonna go like that in Vegas for me too, and others are like. Oh, I'm I was a big fish in a small pond. Let me dip my toe. You know those guys are legends out in Vegas. So the first time I came to Vegas was a uh, spring break, a uh, senior year in college. There was uh, probably about a, a dozen of us or so, you know, cramming four people into a ho- uh, to a hotel room at the yeah. Tropicana. Uh, oh, nice, nice yeah, back, accommodations. You know, <laughs> yeah, well, you know it's uh, you know you're just, you're still in college, but I, I remember bringing out the most money of everyone. I remember bringing and this this is one of the one of the few things I remember from that trip. I remember bringing out seventeen hundred dollars, which seemed like all the money in the world. At the yeah, time. I remember being so paranoid about that seventeen. The first thing I did when I got to the room, I said, "Guys, I'm only I'm going to have uh, uh, the, the the box in the room, the security box. You tell me you tell me what you want to put in there, and I'll put in it. But only I'm having access to it." I was so paranoid about it. <laughs> but yeah, that entire trip, uh, I remember playing uh, limit hold. I remember the first time I played three dollars, six dollar limit hold them at the Luxor. Hmm. If I remember correctly, I want to say Excalibur, but Luxor, I'm pretty certain. Right across the street. Yeah. So I remember losing five hundred dollars, and I and I still what uh, three six. I remember. I'm not exaggerating. I literally remember getting Ace King every third hand. And this part <laughs> still holds true. And flopping top pair every hand, not just missing. I remember hitting top pair every hand and lose lose every hand. I remember calling my dad at five in the morning. It was like eight back home, I'm like. And I'm just I'm getting really emotional. Like, Dad, I just lost five hundred dollars. I don't understand what happened. I mean, I flopped top pair, top kicker, every hand or better, <laughs> and I'm losing. I'm seeing I'm seeing a six offsuit for three bets pre I'm seeing ten seven off. I'm seeing someone buy ten five offsuit. Like I can't beat these people. <laughs> uh, and and I remember him calling me down. And to this day, he's still, whenever things have gone down, he's still uh, the person I come I come to the most whenever things aren't uh, going well in poker. Mm-hmm. He's always able to put things in perspective. Well, let's talk about your dad because, yeah. you know, when you first started playing poker, what was his attitude? Uh, because, like, you are <clears> – I mean, as, as much as you downplayed your smarts, you did go to college and graduate with two degrees. You know, so you obviously had a, a plan beyond poker. Not really. Uh, I, I mean – Oh, you had, I'm sure to say options beyond I, I, poker. I'd say this. I look back. I was probably going through the motions as much as anything else. Okay. Uh, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. What were those two degrees, by the way? Uh, marketing and operations management. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, it was still one from the one of the ten best business schools in the country, and uh, it was. You know, I was just going. Not, I didn't even know what I wanted to do. Did I want to be in an office? You know, fifty, sixty hours a week. Uh, did I want to do sales? Eventually, start my own company. I don't know. Uh, but I took a year off after I graduated. Uh, I was goofing around in a quote unquote charity game, uh, and I lose. I use those quotes very loosely. Yeah, uh, back home I would play uh, about three days a week. Well, for those that don't know, the charity games are those uh, non-raked, but you pay for your seat kind of thing. Uh, something like that. Well, that uh, they stole money from the pots, the the dealers. There was so much scumminess going on mm-hmm. uh, at this place. Like, like some stuff I didn't even know until recently, <laughs> uh, which is remarkable. Which uh, my friend, uh, my two of my friends who still play this day. Uh, uh, Nick Wagenti, uh, or Biggie, as some of you, some of you know him as, or almost all of you Omaha know him specialist, as. Omaha specialist, right? Uh, plays everything. Omaha the better. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I like to joke then that he's a, that he is my protege in the mixed games. <laughs> and uh, and Joey Cowden, they're telling me stories I didn't even know that, that existed. Uh, and they're like, how could you not know this? Uh, oh, but, Joey just made a final table, right? Yeah, Joey just finished. Uh, Joey just got to his, I think, third or fourth uh, final table uh, overall. Uh, I think he finished... Uh, 
I think it was fifth place in the uh, 2500 Big Bet Knicks, but he just won his first race of last year mm-hmm. in the 1500 uh, Pot Limit Omaha Eater Better event. And whereas, like, in Biggie, he just uh, finished fourth in the $10,000 Omaha mm-hmm. Eater Better event. And, uh, even though I was sick, I, I literally about the one person I would get out of bed for sick in order to watch uh, play. <laughs> Everybody else. I'll give you the G, the old GL on a uh, on text. Oh, sorry, message. Randy. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, I love you, Randy. Uh, Biggie and I go back like half my life now. So uh, you know, I mean. So what were those? I mean, well, getting back to your dad, what did yeah. he think when you said, "Hey, maybe I want to play poker"? Well, let's put this. I I took a I well, like I, said, I took a year off playing three days a week, and I was doing pretty good. And then uh, about four or five about four or five six months before the uh, World Series, I qualified through the main event through a hundred forty dollars satellite at, at this uh, uh, charity game. And, $140. Yeah, double shoot. It was a double shootout. Nice. And I more or less had my mind made up after the uh after the main event. Uh I was going to get a real job. In fact, the fight, I remember having a couple of interviews lined up afterwards. Uh I said, "Yeah, I mean, I could do it, but I wanted to play this tournament first. I don't want to really think about anything." Uh so and then uh going on a miraculous run, finished 43rd. Um an infamous moment probably everyone has ever seen by now uh, on YouTube or from ESPN back in the day. Like, I was Matt Affleck before Matt Affleck became Matt Affleck. Yeah. Uh, by the way, two people who have gone on to make many more moments in poker. I was going to say, I was wondering, like, you know, you obviously got some TV time. There was that unfortunate flush over flush situation. Mm-hmm. And you were young in a, in a spot, an emotional spot, obviously. You slammed your racket. More or less. Uh, yeah. I, I went. I went macro on everybody. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was. Uh, you know, people were much more emotional. People showed much more stuff now. If that happened now, uh, yeah, it's, that reaction just won't happen. Uh, except maybe I'll just say a couple of curse words maybe to myself now. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to be a robot like you see. I have to play with play the super high rollers. Uh, they're just no fun to watch uh, in those situations. But yeah, so like I, I you know, it was the, so after I went on uh, that deep run. Um, I spoke to a couple of my friends from college, and I asked them what they thought. And then they, my well, friend, how much did you cash for? Uh, two hundred thirty-five thousand uh, after deals and everything. I was still left with a good amount of money after. Two hundred thirty-five thousand for forty-third place. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's what they get now for the forty-third place. Two thirty-five and finishing forty-third back then. Two thousand five is the most uh, money forty-third uh, place has ever been has ever had. And I always look at that every year. That's crazy because the field has grown. Like so crazy somehow my then. year, that's the year it paid the most. I guess it was very top heavy payout yeah, that year. So, right? Yeah, that was a uh, very fortunate uh, in my case. So I remember talking to a lot of my friends from college, and I said, you know, what do you think about me just to enter the real world? Mm-hmm. And they said, uh, Adam, we all hate our jobs. You know, we're <laughs> underpaid. Our bosses are idiots. Uh, and uh, my, my friends are pretty smart. They were they're pretty smart people. They're but they're definitely the work hard, play hard. You know, get everything done, and then just party as hard as hard as you can afterwards. Yeah. Uh, but I remember uh, at the time they all said, "If you don't do it now, you're never going to do it." So I took a year off to see what I could do with it. I spoke things over, uh, you know, with my parents, and my dad uh, af- after deals and after uh, everything was said and done, he took a hundred thousand dollars away from me at the time, and he put it in. Uh, and an investment, which I still have to this day. And he says, Adam, you're never going to see this money again. And that's just, there is no conversation about it. It's the only time in my life I've ever cursed out my dad, and I still, re- and I still regret to this day. But I remember after about a week or so, I said, you know what? My dad's always had my best interest start. He doesn't, you know, this mm-hmm. isn't for him. And if he's doing this, it must be for a reason. It took me until about another year and a half until I finally started, until I finally started saying, oh, okay. Because now I started to see how that 100000 grew without me having to really do much, uh, uh, me have not really. Yeah, it just anything. sits there and, and accumulates interest. Yeah, and yeah, and it's a much better than a savings account or money market. It's uh, it's, it's been very, uh, it's been progressive, but n- nothing too run, nothing risky by any stretch, and it's at a very healthy number now, uh, fourteen years later. But at the time, you know, I look back and said, you know, is it possible I could have gone through all that money? I I don't believe it would have happened, but I also don't hold it as an impossibility that that it couldn't have happened. Right. So. Your dad was protecting you. Yeah, he was protect. He was he was sort of my best. A six guard. figure uh, pillow for yeah, you to 20, land on. When you're 23 years old, I mean, what's going to happen when I'm 23 in Vegas or uh, if I'm in LA? I'm probably going to party. Some, I'm probably do some really stupid things. Uh-huh. So in a way, I, I mean, I did. But were some you a partier? Things. Like I par I partied. Uh, I mean, like so I did some stupid things, but not like not overly extravagant. But you, know, you look back, you think of some of those nights, like man, would I really spend that much money? Who knows how much mm-hmm. more money I would have spent. Uh, looking back, but you know, I had good times, and I look back. I, I always joke with my friends. How much money do you think you've spent on alcohol in your life? And well, like, oh, I don't want to think. I don't want to think how much money I've spent. 
Uh, you could probably buy a couple houses with what, uh, what you know, with what, you know, with what we spent. Like I was like, oh, I'd do anything just to get back ten percent of the money I, I spent back on alcohol back in the day. Right. But you know, it's it was good times. And you're paying a premium for it too. Yeah, but like I said, I, I mean, I did clubs, but I didn't go like to clubs all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd go to bars. You know, I, I went to bars nonstop. But even then, you know, it was it was all good fun. I look back, I don't really have any. I don't did, have regrets. So you never gambled for fun, though. Did I ever gamble for fun? I had one tiny blackjack phase that lasted for literally about two minutes. Okay. I got real lucky one night, won a good amount of money. Over the next uh, few months, I gave back about eighty percent of it, uh, and I knew where the rest was going. I just stopped. The only time I've played maybe blackjack since uh, is if uh, I maybe mean, I think at one bachelor party that had nothing to do with poker players. Mm-hmm. Whenever uh, poker players said, "Hey, let's go. We're just going to gamble. Like, you guys have fun." I don't yeah. want to go out. And it's, it's not fun to me. I, I don't. I don't enjoy just randomly playing blackjack or uh, pie golf for fun. It does nothing for me. Yeah. Well, tell me, uh, what was the the thought process behind turning pro and staying in Ohio? So uh, when I was twenty four, <coughs> when I was twenty three, I took a year off just to see what I could do. Mm-hmm. You know, the worst case scenario, if after one, you know, eight to twelve months and wasn't paying it out, then I was just going to enter the real world. Well, I started playing cash games and vexing. I know I started playing higher and higher. I kept winning. And then I won two tournaments back to back in uh, Louisville uh, at uh, Southern Indiana, which the is the Midwest a, Regional Poker Championships. Yeah, I won a fifteen hundred, a five k, in a four day stretch. Uh, one hundred eighty thousand dollars. Yeah, and I think the other was for thirty five thousand, I, I believe. I, I'm drawing a blank, but I'm like, yeah, let's see. So now you're tw- now I'm twenty four. I'm thinking I'm partying a lot, uh, going to some stuff I would never see otherwise. Yeah. I don't have anybody to tell me what to do. One of the best days of my life was the day I pulled my alarm clock out of my wall. Oh, uh, th- that that I should look that it's probably odd. I consider that a top ten day of my life. The day I pulled the alarm clock out of my wall, but th- that's a, that's a pretty cool day when you can do that. And ninety nine percent of people can't do that. Yeah, uh, not that alarm clocks really exist anymore. But at the time, you know, so different than set the alarm on your phone uh, uh, nowadays. But yeah, that was a, that was a fun day. The minute that I decided to pull that clock out of my wall. Uh, but yeah, in terms. Of, it was where when I was twenty four. You were never going to work for somebody, right? I mean, it's just not. I, in honest, you. I honestly don't know. I, I don't know what was going to happen. I pro- I think it probably would have happened, uh, and gone for the motions. Truth is, I'll never know, and it's just a guess now what, what would happen. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of staying in Ohio, it just so happens that's how it worked out. Uh, I kept saying yeah, I'll move to LA, I move to Vegas, and then also I'd find some reason not to. And yeah, I, Col- Columbus grows on you in a really weird way, in, in a really weird but good way. Uh, in fact, I mean, if you look at the numbers now, more people move to Columbus than any other city in the Midwest, including Chicago. Yeah. People see Columbus and like, you can get to anywhere within 20, 30 minutes. There's never really any traffic. We've got as much, we have as much to do with anything. We still have the Buckeyes. The Blue, the blue Jackets are a huge draw. You, you want uh, you want the Book of Mormon or uh, what was the other big one that came out a year ago or two years ago? Uh, for uh, Spider-Man, Broadway. turn off the dark. No, I'm no, just kidding. I, I'm, I'm, drawing a blank on the, I'm drawing a blank on the real big one, everyone. Uh, you're talking uh, Hamilton, 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 yeah. Every big play comes to, uh, comes to Columbus, mm-hmm. uh, so you've got you can do anything. Look you at you but, talking about the theater merits of a city. Well, well, well yeah, I, I mean, p- people think there's nothing to do there when you're trying to compare it to New York or LA. Yeah, there's not going to be as much to do. I mean, but now you don't have to do Cleveland. You don't have to. <laughs> no, we're, we're we're better than Cleveland, and Cincinnati. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, but so you don't. You, so you, you yeah, and Ohio's got across, casinos too. Yeah, well, yeah, they, that's that's one thing they do have. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, you see a more laid back lifestyle. People are uh, pretty friendly. It's more it's more down to earth. People aren't o- like too overly friendly where it seems fake, like down south. But you know you don't see any fake uh, fake or tragedy. People like you'll meet out maybe in some of the other uh, bigger cities uh, in this country in the, in the country. Uh, but there's just as much to do uh, in Columbus. Everything comes uh, through there, and you could find you could find a, you could find a lot worse in uh, the majority of places. Yeah. All right. Well, tell me uh, a little bit about the downtimes. Uh, was there ever a stretch where you went, oh man, maybe I should start looking for that <laughs> nine to five gig. Yeah, two uh, two thousand seven. Uh, I remember people telling me about losing years. I'm like, losing years? I don't recall having losing months. Yeah, uh, that's like, these people were just awful at poker. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, it just somehow just went like five six months. I couldn't win a hand to save my life. Uh, and I remember the two thousand seven World Series. I'm playing mostly cash, and I'm just getting buried nonstop. And I still remember the hand that that uh, that took me home for the summer. It was just it was just a, it was just a limit hold of man play, uh, where I remember raising ace king of hearts under the gun. Small small blind calls. The flop goes queen of hearts, jack of hearts, like six. He <laughs> check calls, turns a offsuit seven. He check calls, rivers an offsuit deuce. He checks, and I said, "All right, I give up." I'm expecting to see a jack or something, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. 
you turn over ace deuce offsuit, you rub it an offsuit deuce. <laughs> I remember seeing that hand, and I just, I lost it. I cursed, and I said, F this, I'm out of here. I left. I remember leaving the Bellagio around like 4.30 or 5.30 uh, midweek. I booked the next flight out of Columbus the following day, or to get back home to Columbus the following day. Uh, I couldn't take it anymore. I skipped the main, the one year I've skipped the main event. I couldn't take it anymore. I'm like, you they win. They broke you. Oh, they, 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 they completely broke my spirit. I can't take it anymore. So, so what, how, <clears throat> how'd you get back? Well, let's see. Over the next, uh, I remember the first two weeks I got home. The only time I left my room was to go to the bathroom and grab food from downstairs. I didn't talk to anybody. You were depressed. Incredibly depressed. I just, I, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know. I've tried everything. I basically went months. I didn't shave. I didn't talk. To, I mean, I mean, I started speaking to people after a couple of weeks, but I just everything seemed meaningless. Like I, I don't know how to get out of this. And then uh, I, I remember that my uh, like my best friend from college got married, so I had to. I guess I had to cut it down a little bit. Or a clean face. <laughs> now, granted, I uh, I've had maybe a clean face now in four years, but that's by choice now. Uh, although it's, it always gets a little sloppy during the World Series after the three weeks. I've never found a barber out here I like. Uh, which I'm sure there are some. I, no, might, I need to ask you afterwards if you have a barber who can, who can help trim me up. I don't even have hair, so don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, but no, no, I understand, <laughs> but the facial hair is working. You know, I mean, I, that's, I gotta, I gotta get this trimmed down a little bit. If you got somebody, yeah. recommend, you know, so I, I, problem I, with finding a barber in Vegas is they leave after two months anyway. So exactly, uh, and, uh, and that's one thing I remember. I remember having one guy about eight, nine years ago, and he wasn't there a year later. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, now I just wait till I, literally it's the first thing I do when I get home the following day. I call my guy, hey, it's, and whatever time you got, I'm in. You back say, back to Ohio time to shave it up. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah. So all of a sudden, so I remember doing that, and all of a sudden, I remember around Thanksgiving, I said, Adam, you got to you got to snap out of this. I remember literally talking out loud to myself, uh, you got to snap out of this, otherwise you got to get a real job. So I said, all right. So I basically had a game plan. I'll tell you, I said, let me just wait till the end of the year. The year's almost over. There's no reason to do a trip now. Just wait till 2008, and we'll see what happens. So I got. Uh, I decided to do a short trip to LA for about a week or so. I said, no matter what happens, you have to become winner of this trip. No matter what, no exception. I remember being up a small amount, relatively speaking, with about two days to, two days to go. So you know what? This is just to get your confidence back. I locked myself in my room, my, my hotel room for two days. It was so important to become winner. It didn't have to. It didn't have to be a lot. So you were in the middle of your session for the week. Yeah, about four about four or five days I played. I'm, I'm up a small amount, nothing major. Uh, but I'm up a small amount, but and it doesn't even cover anywhere near one. Like I think maybe it covered like five percent of what I was stuck for the. Uh, previous year i said uh just take the win you're gonna be in a much better mindset when you go home so i just literally locked myself into my room at the commerce for two days straight ordered about a hundred dollars worth of videos or movies at the time and had food delivered up i wasn't leaving my room under any circumstance until uh until i said adam we have your ride uh, to go back to lax mm-hmm. so that's what i did went home felt good about what i did booked the win yeah but which is important sometimes w's are sometimes the name of the game when you're running bad it doesn't have to be just small just to get the confidence going yeah and then uh like less than a month later, or two three weeks later, whatever it was, I then when the win the Midwest Regional Poker Championship began, and mm-hmm. I basically got back nearly everything I was stuck for the year before. I was like, wow, what a relief! That's... Hey, you won that one for a hundred thousand, mm-hmm. and then the next year you went back and won it again for yes. almost a hundred thousand. Yeah, so I've done the back to back thing a couple things a couple times. Yeah, so, and technically, uh, when I wanted those three years, I didn't play it the one year in between. So technically, I won it three the three three times when I played it. Uh, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. Winning three. I mean, there's been some runs. Uh, I think Mike Leah has a run in Falls View uh, where he won a bunch of those back to back. But yeah, winning three out of four is, is as strong as it gets. I think. Yeah, and actually, I have a second streak as well currently going. Uh, the uh, the tour I play on the most is the MSPT because I'm really good friends with the uh, I'm really good friends with uh, with the owner of the tour, and I I just like how they treat everybody. Mm-hmm. But uh, currently, I've, I finished third in, uh, in the MSPT Cleveland slot the last two Januarys. Oh, there you go. So I've got, I've got two other. they, they got a tournament coming up in August, uh, which I'm going to see, I'm gonna try to see if I can finish third again. Would you rather finish third or second next time? If third pays $1 more, third place. Okay, there you go. I so, say it'd be cool to get. But hey, I, I, out of 600 people, if someone says you're going to finish third, uh, you know, go, sure. Yeah, take it. I'll, 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 take, I'll take my 50, 60x buy-in. <laughs> go from there. All right, so... Uh, Let's talk about the first bracelet. 2012, $5,000 buy-in, seven-card stud, eight or better. You won 270 grand. Pretty stacked final table. Angry John was there. Bryn Kenny, Phil Ivey, Todd Brunson, Yakovenko. <laughs> and Adam Friedman comes away with the win. Yeah. Yakov, Yakov, you know, Nikolai, he was my lucky charm uh, for both my first and my second uh, 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 bracelets. But, yeah, that... 
I don't remember much of day one of that tournament looking back, but day two, I remember just getting into some massive spots where I just had huge free roll uh, spots, and I just remember hitting a few of them. And one person that having, st- I remember one hand, some guy starts to play kings like hot and ace right away for aces, made aces up. I had him dead to a two outer, but I ran out of low board to even he made three kings. He was never raising me, and I was just I steadily went up the uh, leaderboard. And if I remember correct, I think I was the chip leader at the end of day two, with approximately twenty players give or take a few remaining. And then uh, Phil Helmuth basically donated me a ton of chips uh, with two tables to go in a, in a massive pot, where he overplayed his hand, and I had like the, I had an open. I basically had I had the I had the low locked up. I'm open ended with a flush draw, and uh, I I went for the real slow peel against him because it's impossible not to. Yeah. Usually I would just go pretty quick, but him I really took my time. <laughs> so let's, let's draw this out just a little bit, and peel off. I remember peeling off the Queen of Hearts on him. Uh, and bang that, so with my six low and queen and queen I flush scooped a huge pot off of him and a few of the pots happened. Next thing I know, I, I think I was the chip leader going to the final table. It was pretty close with uh, with Todd or John. I, I, I'm drawing a blank on that, but uh, I just want some pots early on. Uh, there was one person on my left who was pretty inexperienced, but I was able to steal some small pots from left and right whenever it got folded to me. I just never defended, or just, no, even though it was obvious. I thought it was blatantly obvious I was stealing in certain spots, mm-hmm. but eventually. <clears throat> Phil Ivy was completely card dead that tournament. He never had a ch- he never had a chance, and you need to catch some cards eventually and, st- uh, and study it better. You just can't bluff your way. It's just, it just it can't happen in that game. Uh, but eventually, I got three handed with uh, Todd and John, who I still believe are uh, especially John probably maybe the two best study or better players in the world. Uh, and I still think John uh, is the best player I've ever played with. Um, uh, you know, which most people you know, come on this podcast, John. I'll uh, I'll tell the angry one to maybe uh, eventually come down here sometime. He's told me yes to my face, yeah. but then he tells Diana to tell me no behind my back. Oh, really? He does. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, maybe 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 it makes wait. sense. Yeah, he's maybe. a very private guy. I, he he is. I mean, like I said, I, I mean it's true. I mean, of course, he's going to be having his first shot, so maybe maybe then he'll want to talk open yeah. up a little bit. So uh, eventually, uh, I think we played three handed for a while, uh, maybe like an hour or so, and. John ran really bad in a few spots, and eventually Todd and I got heads up. We played heads up for nearly four hours. Just, it yeah, was that was back sm- when they weren't stopping the events yeah, we played, at midnight. We played, <laughs> we played till, I mean, I'll, eventually Todd had me down maybe 3-1, to 4-1 to one at one point, and it was looking pretty bleak, and then I had a real key hand against him. I got real lucky to catch an ace on the river and a hand that played itself. And then I just, a couple small, and all of a sudden I scooped two pots. Um, we're both drawing a low, and next thing I make a pair of tens, he bricks his open and a straight low draw. Uh, and then... The final hand, uh, he raises a 10, and he'd only been raised when he had it. I had two jacks buried, and I waited until on 5th Street we got the rest of the money, and I made he made I made jacks up, he made 10s up, and fortunately I pit them, and that was it. Yeah. So where's – where'd uh, – okay, well, first let's talk about what the bracelet means to you because I, I don't know if you have a different opinion of what you did four years ago when I interviewed you, <coughs> but you said – the bracelet is just a symbol of success, which is money. Money is the most important thing. You referenced Mike Sexton and said the object of the game was to increase your bankroll, improve your lifestyle, provide for your family. You know, do you still feel that way? Yes. Or do you not want any glory? I wanted glory when I was 23, 24, mm-hmm. when I didn't know any better. I wanted to be famous, and then that went away in literally in two minutes. <laughs> uh, it, it, it all comes down to the money eventually. Uh, uh, this is an <laughs> This is the most difficult profession anyone could ever do. You really got to be out of your mind to really want to do this. Anyone who's ever approached me, I've always said, don't do it. Just keep it as a hobby. If you can make money on the side doing it, do it that way. Yeah. You, you don't know. When you run bad for six months straight or a year straight, the emotion, not just the, the turmoil of maybe not having uh, enough money, the emotional turmoil, what does you say, uh, psychologically, is just damaging to you. Uh, most people don't know how to deal with it. I know I didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, I, again, I, I you see some of these players who, who travel the World Series circuit year in and year out. You know they get a they have one maybe they got they got a ring every year. Mm-hmm. Win what eight, ten, twelve grand for their event. I mean, I, I don't understand how they're able to make any money after all this. Uh, it's basically cost ten thousand a week to do what they do, uh, and I'm not sure what the numbers are trying to make at all, at all these spots. The expenses are brutal. They they go to every random spot. Some of these spots I would never go to. Uh, which I know a lot of people want. I mean, I mean, I know you have to do what you have to do, but I just don't understand why a lot of these players, if they're going to go throughout, why aren't they playing cash games? Uh, right, I, keep the expenses I, down. I don't get it. It makes zero sense to me. I mean, these guys are, I mean, the majority of these players are after glory. 
you got to, I mean, what well, happens, what happens, you, what happens you when you play... have a wife or a husband or if you have a children? You're chasing glory. You need to be chasing money to be able to provide. Cash games will always be the way to go as opposed to playing small tournaments. Now, I guess if you're playing all the bigger tournaments uh, and not stop, okay, it makes now a little bit more sense. I, I can, you can, It's justified a little bit more. But to play every $200, $300 pot to win seven, eight grand and win a ring at the end of the day, mm-hmm. it makes doesn't make any sense to me. It never has. Yeah. Well, uh, what's your yearly schedule like? I know you play tournaments during the summer, and you obviously play those MSPTs and regional stuff, but is it just cash every other day? No, no. I, I, I On the first amount, I play probably less poker than the average uh, person who plays full-time. Uh, uh, I get knocked on for a little, playing as little as I do. I should probably play more. Um, I'm just I'm fortunate. I'm in a spot in my life. I don't have to, mm-hmm. but I keep it partially because I keep investing cor- uh, correctly. Uh, and old Adam, which I'm sure we'll talk about later on, old yeah. Adam will be taken care of well. Uh, on average, uh, I come out here every summer for six, seven weeks. Uh, I do a few trips to LA every year. I usually go for about a month, about a month, month and a half or so in the fall. I then go to the LAPC for about anywhere from f- I've done anywhere from three to six weeks. On average, probably about four to five. Well, they have a decent mixed game schedule too, right? Yeah, and the cash games are usually going during then. And then I'll do like the occasional week or two. Maybe if I'm just in the mood to fly out like in April or something for a week or two, I'll do that as well. Uh, but yeah, and then when I'm back home. I know there, there just isn't a cash game there that, that that really motivates me. Games are much smaller, and nothing nothing good can ever come from me playing. When I if I if I if I lose in a session, I'm thinking, wow, I'm losing here. I don't know how that's possible. And if I'm winning, well, if I was in LA or Vegas, look how much more I'd be winning right now. That's true. So it's it's it's, it's terrible. That's where my mindset's at. I wish it wasn't. I shouldn't look at it like mm-hmm. that. But I know I'm not the only one who thinks like that either. Because I had, because some names I won't say they feel the exact same way I do when they're not. Uh, out in uh, you know L.A., Vegas, or South, or South Florida, Atlantic City, uh, doing what they do, but it, it's just a weird mindset, and it's not even a good. That's not how you're supposed to look at it or approach it, but it's hard to escape that mindset when you when you think like that. But yeah, when I'm back home, uh, I will generally play every MSPT tournament uh, that's within a two, three, four hour drive of me, whether it's uh, uh, upstate in, uh, at Firekeepers in that state up north, mm-hmm. uh, or they have stops in Cleveland or. Uh, down Tropicana, Evansville, so, so anything that's relatively close, and uh, I'm, I'll usually add an MSPT like if it's, if it's somewhere like in Iowa or something, something where I know I'm going to go to LA or Vegas, and all it is oh, that like Council Bluffs, yeah, uh, yeah, oh uh, 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 yeah, well, yeah well, uh, I, I'm trying, I miss Waukee, I think's in Iowa. Oh okay, okay. So what I'll do is I'll add one flight onto my trip. So all I'm adding is one extra fl- uh, flight for three, four days. Yeah, and expenses are minimal that way, just to go out of my way to play, to play a tournament, regardless of who it is for. I would never do that. Uh, like I said, I can't justify the expenses. But if it's like on my way to or on my way back, it's not like I'm adding multiple trips. It's mm-hmm. three, four days. Expenses are minimal. Um, and well, let's talk about these uh, these expenses and or just your mindset when it comes to playing cards, growing that bankroll. You know, money being the overall indicator of success. Uh, you're you're obviously game selecting pretty damn hard. Uh, <coughs> I mean, I, ju- I have a general game I play when I'm in L.A., uh, you know, whether it's at uh, Hawaii. Well, that's what I was about to say. Like, at the, the games you play, the stakes you play, how much game selection even is there? There's not as much as you would like. Um, it's not like back in, back in the 10, 12, 14 years ago where there would be like 15, 1, 200 games going of limit hold'em and got and X amount of games and mixed games going, and then another 15 tables of 48 or 60, 120 limit hold'em going. And this doesn't even include all the no limit that was going on. Yeah. All the 10, 20, or 20, 40 no limits. Uh, one, two, two, 400 mix, 400 mix that was going on in LA every day. But the majority of these people, they whether it's through just not being good enough, bad or bad, they're bad at uh, money management, the majority of these players have all gone by the wayside. Um, egos get in the way, and you need to be very objective. And although some of what I say to my uh, friends, and even, you know, just, you know, just people, it can come off each, sometimes occasions arrogant because I don't always show the best tact. I'm very objective with what I say. I know where I stand uh, overall. I, I I I know deep down who I know who I think is better than me, and people who I know who I'm better than. Um, but ninety, in my opinion, about ninety eight, ninety nine percent of people, they're not objective. They're the greatest that ever lived. Sliced bread has nothing on them, mm-hmm. uh, and they just. Uh, they can't take a step back and be very honest with where they stand. Uh, and what's worse is once they start running bad in their uh, games or tournaments, uh, once they don't have the, the correct funds to play, like the tournaments they're playing in, they refuse to play smaller tournaments if that's the route they've decided to go. So, no, nah, no, no, I'm going to fire. I'm going to get out of this. And what happens? You just keep striking out. Oh, what do you know? Now you're broke. Yeah. 
the ego gets to them. They can't drop down. Yeah. Or even just change the game or, and the players. Yeah, because it's it, there's no shame in going down when you can't afford it. The, in my opinion, the shame is going broke uh, because of bad because of bad decisions. Well, this is the perfect time to bring up something you said after your more recent uh, WSP victory, which we will talk about. Uh, but you said your proudest accomplishment wasn't those back-to-back bracelets. It was not going broke your entire career. Never been broke, never even been close to being broke. Uh, I've been fortunate that I've had minimal expenses uh, throughout my time, which I don't deny. Uh, but, yeah, I, I'm very careful and very how I, how I do everything. Like when I go to L.A. Uh, for you know multiple trips a year, I'm always on I'm searching Airbnb, VRBO, how can I cut things down? But I've learned to have a little bit more fun with things. So fortunately, I'm in a spot where... Right, but you're also playing stakes where, I mean, the expenses of your of your rental are probably minimal to well, a big blind. It, it depends how... Well, it is. It depends how you look at it. So for instance, I, t- I took the longest trip I've ever done uh, in my life this previous fall. I went for eight weeks. I was just curious what it would be like to be in L.A. Mm-hmm. So fortunately, uh, I got very lucky finding a place... Uh, Three blocks from the Hermosa, from the Hermosa Beach Pier, nice. which anyone who's, I mean, which I believe yeah. you've been to Hermosa, Manhattan, it's a it's a great area to, uh, when of you're not course. playing. Yeah, it's fun, relaxing, it's chill. You don't need to drive your car anywhere. Once your car is parked for two three days, you walk everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. I that that that's almost like a dream to me. It doesn't even make sense in a lot of ways that that places like that exist. Well, you're from but, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> well, what places like what places in general exist where I'm, you can just walk everywhere? You don't need your car. I'm that from, doesn't exist. Uh, I, I grew up in South Beach, so. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I'm spoiled. I know. Oh, okay. You grew up in South Beach. Huh? <laughs> Must be nice, but yeah. So, uh, yeah, but you know, but, oh yeah, Manhattan Beach. Funny. Yeah, you have the volleyball court. Yeah, of course, yeah. it's just it's just gorgeous. Everything's just gorgeous out there. This weather is just fantastic. Uh, but yeah, that, but that's like in my off time, and I will admit about. So usually when I'm playing Monday through Thursday, Monday through Friday, about one day I'll wake up, I'll go for about a three, four mile walk, I then come back and I'll look around. Yeah, I'm not playing today. Yeah. The weather's way too good. Uh, why would I want to do that when I can just be out here? Just I can just go to the bars, watch some get, watch some hockey or baseball, whatever's going on. Uh, usually that time of year, uh, watch my Columbus Blue Jackets player. The usually the playoffs are going on, so I'm just, I can just go there, spend thirty, forty bucks, be there for four or five hours. Going for Taco Tuesday. What's wrong with that? It's just yeah. it's fun. It's relaxing. But in terms of expenses, though, it, it does get expensive. So I'm there for 56 nights, and I got very fortunate. I found a spot for, uh, I think I was still misquoted. Uh, I was able to find a place that I think should have gone for 15000 or so. I was able to find it for about $5,500. Wow. Uh, but between that, car rental, flight, gas, that all alone for two months, that came to about, I'm trying to do quick math in my head, about Seven thousand, seven five hundred dollars, approximately. You know, that's a lot to overcome. You're Plus, you're paying expenses at home. Exactly. So you have all, you have all those expenses, and then that's, this is include you're spending more on food when you're in LA as opposed to at like Columbus uh, when you're going out uh, because when friends invite you. Sometimes you're going to go. Try to keep things minimal when someone says, "Hey, let's go to this new place up in West Hollywood or in Beverly Hills." Great! Oh yeah. my way, can't wait to spend another couple hundred dollars. Maybe credit uh, card roulette will save me. Yeah, oh, exactly. Well, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I'm definitely plus CV over the years, but I, I, enjoy, I love hanging out with my friends. Uh, especially, I got to type some non poker friends out in LA that I, enjoy, I, I, I truly enjoy hanging out with uh, 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 in LA a lot. But uh, yeah, you bring up a good point. You're, you know, you're, you're in for eight grand yeah. plus expenses at home. Yeah, you got to win yeah, fifteen to profit. Exactly. You, you have to eventually make the money somewhere. And you know, these the last few years, I. Uh, I, I, yeah, it's, it hasn't been the best uh, few years in terms of like I should have won, not as it's just been a lot less than, than I believe it should be. But you know, it happens. You go through cycles. But it, I, I've been able to enjoy life much more when I'm out there. Uh, which to me, that's another reason why I would never do the circuit. When someone goes to Tunica or goes <laughs> to Foxwoods or half these other stops, you name them, and I can't and shit on my sponsors. And like. oh well, so, <laughs> well, you know, you know, what I'm saying in the downtime. I mean, you're in the middle of like you know, some of these spots for 10, 12 days. I mean, I don't oh, want to. No, what am there. I going to do with my off time? It's just, or is I can be maybe this I casino be has a bowling alley or a movie theater. Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know how many movies one as good can as see. it gets. Yeah. I don't know how many movies one can see over 10, 12 days. Uh, uh, and you know, bowling's fine once in a while, but I'm like, I can't do it every day. Mm-hmm. The, the blisters, you know. Yeah. We get older. These things. I don't remember getting blisters this often. Plus going those on? lane balls are gross, you know. It's yeah, it's just putting those shoes on. Yeah. All right, so let, let's talk a little bit about going broke. Uh, you know, you don't do that. <laughs> you, you're an investor. Your dad put away oh, six figures so that you wouldn't do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, that puts you in a very, very, very small minority of poker players who have planned for the future. I'm I'm very lucky. I basically had my dad as a teacher uh, for me. 
uh, in terms of money, how to think of things for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, several very well-known poker players have uh, noted how incredible, very fortunate that I, I was able to get this for free. Uh, so being some very well-known players and, and some of the younger players, somehow room, things are getting out that I'm, I'm like the guy people should talk to and some people do and I keep things very private. I don't talk about anybody's business or expenses, but uh, people are asking me what I should do with certain things and I won't tell them specific investments. That's You need to research your own. Um, but I, yeah, it's I not like invest in X company. No. Yeah, yeah, do this, invest in this stock. I think it's at X amount. I think it's going to go to this. For the most part, I do have a philosophy that my dad taught me, and I, I, I think it's proven to be correct over the years. You can gamble for a living, which I do, or you can gamble on the stock market. You can't do both. So a lot of my investments are very safe. Uh, there's there's a, a, a small, very small percentage. Aggressive. There. Yeah, uh, but nothing that's like super concerned. It's something that's going to obviously outweigh when times are going bad. But, you know, the investments have done really well, and I I do know by the time 15, 20 years from now or whenever I become senile one day, which I figure is inevitable, uh, you know, could be four or five years from now. Who knows where, where my mind's going to be. <laughs> but uh, there's going to be a lot of money waiting for me at the end, and I don't need I don't need all the money today. It, yeah. It's, I'm 37. I got I, I figure I got, a, I got a long ways. got another 50 years to go or so, hopefully. And uh, Well, old, that's what I was, was going to get to. I mean, you know, you look at some of these poker players and, you know, not everybody can compete to the age of Bill of even Eric Seidel, it's, you know. It, it, it's, but then you have people like Billy Baxter and Doyle Brunson who are gone. Like th that's so rare. And by the way, everyone should play with Billy Baxter at one point. He's the greatest player to ever play with. He tells the greatest stories. Yes, you. He's going to be on this. You show. literally will not care if you go broke. You don't <laughs> care if you go broke in the tournament. It doesn't matter. It's it's literally worth paying whatever the buy-in is just to hear his stories. Yeah, he's the best. Uh, and everyone's ever played with him. You all know I'm right with that. Uh, but, yeah, just in terms of, uh, you know, as long as my mind's right, hopefully I can play the game for another 15, 20, 25 years. This isn't what I expected uh, to still be doing. But, you know, if this is what it goes out, there could be a lot worse things I could be doing. But how many poker players are right now in their mid-30s, and they can do the same thing? They could probably play another 15, 20 years. They're probably at the top of their game right now. They may even have $5 million in the bank. And how many of them don't have any money being set aside for retirement, and you just have a feeling what comes – when they, when they hit their mid-50s, it could be a sad story. And the one thing that's a certainty that happened, if you don't have a plan for the money, you have to lose it all. That's a certainty. If you do not have a plan for the money, it doesn't matter whether you have 50 grand or if you have 5 million. And no kid yourself, not not, 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 not only a couple people maybe have 5 million. Right, of it's course. All, right, but like, but I'm, my point is no it terms. doesn't, yeah. the high rollers are not immune. No, of course not. I mean, if they don't have a plan, they'll lose the money too. None of these, none of those guys are immune. Nobody's immune that plays in Bobby's room. If you don't have, no, if you don't have a single plan for the money in terms of investing or buying real estate or just anything that's just of semi-intelligence, you have to lose the money. You can't just sit there. I mean, Archie, look at Archie Kerr is probably the best example at all. Has 40 million. What does he want to do? I mean, God. I mean, God forbid he just puts a few million away. But no, I have to keep gambling. I have to keep playing. What's the end game? Yeah, you have. There has to, has to be some sort of end game, some sort of plan down the line. Uh, you, you know, eventually, you know, eventually, just to find maybe a wine to eventually get out. Or, or if you're, you know, you want to have some money lying around. But if you don't, he's in, inevitably what him losing the money. How is that surprising? You know, forty million was gone. What in two minutes, basically? Let's say you win the main event this year. I'm gone. I'm retired. Done. I will, never play another hand again. I will. I am official, and everybody who knows me knows that's the fact. If I win, if I win the money, I am gone. <laughs> uh, I'll have nothing left to prove. I have nothing left to. Well, I, I, I don't like. I, I don't feel like I have anything to prove to anybody. Right. It's just to, anything's to myself. Uh, what people feel about that, you know, it's whatever. No, uh, I'll have after all the taxes and you know, whatever deals or swaps that I'll have uh, made out. Uh, I'll have more than enough money. Uh, how much money do you really need? That's why. Okay. Well, I don't want to name names, but there are people who play poker who have other jobs who have hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank and it's all about ego it's all about beating the best you have none of that not at all uh, <clears throat> when i was younger yeah i had an ego i wanted to be in bobby's room this and that uh, my ego went away a long time ago in spite of how like i said times sometimes i know it can come off as arrogant or i'm the most i, I have to be the smartest person in the room based on how i act or how, what i say that's just not the case maybe like i said i don't always show the best tact for that, well, maybe I have one thing to still grow up on. Oh, one thing. Probably several things still to grow up on. You speak candidly and matter-of-factly. That's I, all. I try to. I, I don't hide. I don't BS people. I'm going to tell you what you want. You know, if you ask me a question, I'm going to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you the sun's going to come out and there's going to be rainbows. I know, I've never <laughs> been that guy. Uh, I'm going to give you an honest answer. And if you can't appreciate that because you don't want to hear the answer you want to hear, 
go go talk to your wife or your mother or whatever. Or your best friend is going to tell you what you want to hear. It's not going to be what's best for you. Yeah. But I'm always going to be honest. And anyone knows me knows I'm always very objective. You know, if somebody asks me a question, I don't know the answer. I'll think about it for a while before I respond. And if I still can't come up with an answer, I'll think, I, I can't give you a good answer. Yeah. And I don't want to just you know, throw out just some, some random answer, which I could do. Everybody needs a friend like you, honestly. Somebody who will never sugarcoat it, you know, speak the truth. Yeah. A good sounding board, too, like who won't let you hear what you want to hear. Well, sugarcoat stuff is nothing I'm definitely not known for and never will be. Yeah, I just, you know, I, you know, like I said, I think you just, like I said, most people aren't objective about things. You need to be able to take a step back uh, and say, you know, can I beat this game? Uh, am I going to be, you know, do I have enough, do I, do I at least I, do, if I'm going to be on the road the next several months, do I have all my expenses covered for the next 12 months or 24 months uh, while doing this? Because this is a crazy profession. You need to have money set aside for everything, not just for short, not just for uh, the long term, like I always plan it, but you need to have short term in case things happen too. You, know, you could wind up accidentally in the hospital. Uh, insurance only covers so much. Do you have enough money to cover in case uh, uh, some random So you do have health account? insurance. Yes, I do. That uh, puts you in 1% of poker players. <laughs> are you kidding? Well, I mean, poker players have to pay out of pocket for a lot of stuff, but uh, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of people out there who are going with without. That's real. Well, like I said, you know, they, they, they say the average person in poker uh, is more intelligent uh, than the average Joe. Uh, stuff like that. No. This is basic common sense. Well, with intelligence comes entitlement, too, right? Like, yeah. people who think it can't happen to me. Of course it can happen to anybody. No. I we got, actually did a series in Card Player. Uh, one of our columnists, uh, Dr. Alan Schoonmaker, <laughs> after Gavin Smith passed away, and um, what came out, what people were doing some crowdfunding for for his kids. Uh, you know, it came out. He basically wrote a series of articles analyzing why poker players go broke or or eventually leave the game with nothing. And he said most of it comes down to ego. Of course, and yeah. they just can't realize when they don't have it anymore. Or yeah, I mean the game passes some people by, but I mean, and I and I I, I felt really bad when Gavin passed away. I donated uh, money myself uh, to Gavin's fund, uh, but yeah, Gavin and I went drinking a few nights over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, we used to bet on the Voice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that was a fun back in the day when he thought the Voice was gonna be the greatest show. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm very upset with how that should. No one's ever become big from that show, which is disappointing. But yeah, we bet. I on, mean, does anybody really become? There was. No, I mean, American, American Idol had a couple. No, Kelly like, Clarkson and Carrie uh, Underwood. Uh, Chris, Chris Daughtry came out. Uh, oh yeah, that's right, Daughtry. Uh, who else? Well, what has he done lately? Come on, Daughtry. Uh, he's got some. Good, he's, got, he's always had good music. Uh, <laughs> uh, a couple other individuals. I can't think. Of, a couple other individuals. I can't think off the top of my head. Uh, you know, they've made it. And it's like Adam Lambert's not the lead singer of Queen. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I yeah. mean, uh, you know, you're taking over Freddie Mercury's job. I mean, I mean, that's like basically like one notch short of somehow. Uh, all right, who wants to replace John Lennon and George Harrison? Now? <laughs> yeah. well, we can never do that. That would just never exist. Uh, but, yeah, just like I said, people aren't – but getting back, people need to be, take a step back, be objective. Maybe having something – yeah. Like I said, it's it's just so weird. I keep saying, you know, I, I need to cut people out of my life, and I keep adding friends to my life. Uh, I don't know why this keeps happening because even once you get older, it's just, all right, you know, you got enough people in your life, you know. Just really <laughs> shorten down. But, yeah, I, I, yeah, but people are, you know, people ask me you know, questions, and I'm always – I'm willing to answer for anybody. Even if it's people I'm not really necessarily crazy about. If people want to ask me a question, you know, I'll, I'll give you an answer. I'll give you basic guidelines, which I think you know, I want you to set up. Uh, you know, so I've got my accountant to ask questions when anything ever happens. I've got my financial advisor to talk to back home. Uh, we, we, her and I, we speak, we speak every, a few times uh, every year, uh, just that, that we're on page in terms of what I'm looking for, my uh, mm-hmm. uh, long-term goal, my short and long-term goals. But, yeah, if I mean – but it's it's sad. But like even Gavin, I mean, he had what six million uh, in earnings. Exactly. But you know, gamble, Gavin liked to have a good time. I know he didn't have many regrets, uh, unlike the majority of people. But you know, it's just and it's sad that he didn't set a little bit aside for you know once he had children. And uh, I'm glad the, the poker community came together and was able to raise some money for his kids. But unfortunately, Gavin's not an isolated incident. Yeah. This is the majority of poker players. Uh, people like I said, people that travel, you know, all these stops and. At the end of the day, I mean, I mean, do they even have a? Uh, I mean, they still have an, they have an apartment for rent, or they don't even have a house or that real estate, uh, or there's any type of investments in the stock market, uh, or anything. Yeah, forget else. the four hundred one k. Yeah, forget that. I mean, like I, said, I, I consider myself fortunate. I have three different retirement uh, funds. Uh, and fortunately, I'll be able to invest. In, uh, I'll go for the pure max again this year after everything's settled. Uh, 
uh, good to go. So well, let's talk about this year. Uh, let's talk about last year first. Uh, you go to the World Series. They have this uh, $10,000 Dealer's Choice 6 Max event. You win that one for 293 k Then you come back this year and you have the audacity <laughs> to do it again, this time for 312000 going back to back in the same event. That's, I mean, that. forget the money. That's six hundred k total. But that's that's got to mean something to you, right? I, I, I was even shocked. I mean, once it was over, uh, no one in my hand, I didn't think what exp- and uh, sooner than did. I'm just like, wow, did I really do that? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, like I said, I, I've never been like, I've never been truly big in all the records, but I guess I just found out, like I just found out a couple of days ago. I, I guess I'm the seventh person to ever win the same event back to back, and I know no one's ever three peated, so I got something to look forward to next year potentially. Yeah. Uh, but you know, these things can go in so many different directions. I, I look at last, like last year, for instance, when we were playing one hour blind levels. You know, I, I could have I could have easily finished eleventh as easily as I could have won the whole uh, won the tournament this year with the new improved uh, structures. Uh, ODB, we thank uh, all the all the uh, players that play the ten Ks. We thank you. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it, it lets it lets much more play towards the end when the money matters the most. You know, a few more people get knocked out early. Nobody objects to that because you just don't want to crap you where it comes down to maybe one maybe one or if you're lucky even two hands uh, in these events uh, where maybe you're getting scooped in a Bedusi or Bedusi or you lose a triple draw or stud pot or something. And you just want to be able to just be able to give yourself just a little bit more play when the money matters most. And I, I was just fortunate where I went on a big rush at the end of the day two, still stayed heading on day three, and uh, was able to get heads up and uh, just made a few more hands and just the one big element hold him hand at the end against uh, Sean, and that was it. Uh, now, I know you don't care about the bracelets. Other than what they're worth, melted it's, it's, down. It's, it's to gold. nice. I mean, I'll, I mean, it's nice, but you know, like, so I'm, it's not like. What's I'm, the price of gold right now? I, I believe, believe me, I, I have tried finding out what, what the bracelets go for. Uh, but do so, you, do you have them anywhere special, hanging up in a on the wall? They're on a, they're on my desk. They just sit down on the desk, they're, huh? They're, 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 I think the two are literally on top of each other. Like the, so, when I get back home, the third one I'll just put right on top of uh, in, the, in its box. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's uh, see, like last, like the uh, the only time I've ever brought it out. Uh, the, when I won my first one seven years ago, went to some club that doesn't exist anymore. But they said uh, we're going to celebrate the fact that you won this. If you come out, we'll give you three free bottles and we'll give you discounted bottles all night. All right, you got me. Yeah, there you that's go. A good way, that's a good way to bring up the. Oh yeah. That. So yeah, we probably spent like six hundred. Probably should have been about fifteen hundred or so. But yeah, that that was completely worth it. I always wonder um, people don't wear the bracelet around the the, the Rio. You, you I, do I get know. stares. I was carrying uh, Barry's bracelet around because he left it in his car, and I take it to him at the table. Uh, he was doing it for something, and people were eyeing me, just walking around with it in my hand, concealed, like oh, 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 you know. So I, I, I can't imagine, why, I guess, why you would no, it's leave a, it in the box. Well, it was weird. So last year, I remember when I won my uh, second one, uh, I jumped right into the Millie Maker after. Or, was it the Millie Maker? Yeah, well, no, I'm sorry. I take it back. I did jump in the Millie Maker, but a couple of days later, after I got my bracelet for another event, uh, I literally had my bracelet. And everybody on the table wanted to see, and then she passed around like, no. And I was like, wow, this is the, the greatest thing ever. <laughs> and you know, but you know, and people are you. It, it's nice to hear it, you know. But you know, at the end of the day, it's it's you know, what do my what do my fr- uh, friends, close friends, and more importantly, my family, my sister, what do they, you know? Yeah, it's a uh, the money is the most important thing at the end of the day. Uh, in terms of all the adulation, I, the thrill that all my all my friends and family feel that's by far the number two. And then there's a massive drop off after that. The actual <laughs> brace itself. <laughs> Uh, they're nice. You know, it's nice. You know, it, it's it's always nice winning. There's no question it is, uh, but it doesn't define me. Uh, it doesn't change anything I do in day to day. Last few days, like I said, my buddy from Alabama just got into town last night. We go out to, we go out to dinner. We did went duck pin bowling last night. Uh, got hustled out of forty dollars, Wes. Uh, <laughs> no, just just joking, buddy. Uh, but yeah, we, we're uh, you know we're just we're doing the, just. They do nothing, you know, out of the ordinary. You know, just sushi. Life goes on, right? Life goes on, and uh, hanging out with my buddy Dash. Then, uh, like right after I got my bracelet, we just went out to lunch and just chilled and talked about life and talking about him, how he's getting married, and we're talking about that. How this fiance is coming out here a few days from now, and it's so different. I, you know, hanging out with Biggie and a couple of my a couple other close friends, and it's things go on. We don't think anything, you know, don't think anything of it after a while, and. Uh, you know, it's also called my non-poker friends. They, they, they get a huge kick out of it. Like, oh, it's the greatest thing ever. Yeah. Well, also, three puts you in a special club. I mean, winning two, like, sets you apart. 
Winning three, and now the club is sh- you're shrinking. You know, the- a lot of people are winning th- their third one this year. This is a, the a- year of the third, yeah, right? Like, uh, like, it was so so. One of my best friends of poker, uh, FBT, Greg Mueller. Greg Mueller, he also went- been on this podcast. Yeah, he wins the 10K horse like three days beforehand, and Greg loves the attention. Greg loves all the <laughs> adulation. Uh, he gets such a kick out of it. But he's Greg is such a great guy. Uh, he's fun to hang out with. <laughs> when he's when you're losing, he's always an interesting. His guy podcast is one of my favorites. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, listeners, go check out Greg Mueller's podcast. Uh, a lot of Helmuth stories. I remember he told. Uh, and then uh, Scott Clements, who's also a, was on his podcast a couple weeks ago, he just won <laughs> his third. He did. Uh, Pesh De Silva won his third. Pesh won his and, third. Uh, somebody just also won been their, on his podcast. Pesh. And, uh, and somebody just won their third <laughs> bracelet last night. Uh, uh, oh, uh, the Moshi. Guy from, yeah, Asi Moshi. So that's like five, five, like five different people now have won their third yeah. bracelet this year. So. Uh, maybe it's not as exclusive as it was. I mean, if they, if they let people like me win their third bracelet, it's, you know, it shows you anybody. Gotta can get do into it. the four club. Yeah. Oh, All right. For four is worth. Four, everyone knows where four is worth at. <laughs> then you could put one around each ankle. That's. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, yeah, but we'll be good to go. Uh, we end the podcast with some rapid fire questions if you're ready to go. And sorry, I'm keeping you long. No, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, biggest pot you've ever won or lost? Your choice. Uh,. Biggest pot I've ever, a biggest pot I've ever played. I played a, oh, let's see, it's a good question. Uh, I'm trying to think. Not so rapid. Uh, oh, you don't have to answer. Yeah, quickly. no, 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 no. I'm thinking. I'm actually thinking. <laughs> of it. I lost a, uh, I lost a ridiculous no limit. Uh, at t- two thousand, well, the one that sticks out to me. It's not the biggest, but it'll always be the one that sticks out with me when I first started playing bigger. A ten twenty no limit hand in two thousand six. I get it all in on a without getting all the details of that hand. I get it all in on a king king queen three board with king queen, play a near fifty thousand dollar pot at ten twenty. Wow, wow, there must have been crazy straddling. Going I thought on the guy had no 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 straddles on nothing. What? This is back when nobody folded aces. By the way, <laughs> the guy stuck in uh, the guy stuck in uh, eighty dollars pre flop. We got fifteen hundred in. We got about thirteen fifteen hundred on a king queen three board on the flop, and we got the next twenty one twenty two thousand each on the turn when a king hit. An ace at the river, and I just knew it was ace. I, knew, I, he, I mean, God forbid he doesn't have queens full or threes full. He had two aces only. <laughs> I remember screaming a curse word so loud. And if you've been inside the commerce, you know, there's about eight, about 70. Well, it's not like it used to be, but there used to be 70, 80 tables in the main room back in the day. I screamed, mother F this, this and that. <laughs> Half the room stops to see what happened. <laughs> I just stormed. I mean, like I said, this effing idiot, son of a <laughs> B. Oh, Look what he, he stuck that much money in with two aces on King King Queen three. What did he think I had? Jack ten offsuit, <laughs> Queen ten. Do you remember the, the opponent? No, no. He's probably another guy who probably overplayed his hands and is probably uh, not playing anymore. <laughs> well, I remember going to my room for the next two days. Just I ordered so much alcohol to the room. I remember I would just I would go to the ninth floor, grabbing a bunch of Bud Lights, and then I ordered some. I ordered a bottle of liquor. I don't even remember what I ordered. I was probably vodka back then. I was drinking mostly. I just remember drinking the next couple of days, just losing my. I'm like, that is that a happen? big, big hit. That, at that, 10 that, that'll always be the one. That, that that's one. That's one of the two that stand out the most in terms of the worst speed I ever took was a 3060 stud eight hand uh, online back in the day, which is another story. But that's the hand that'll, that'll always get me the most upset. 3060 stud. stud. Well, you don't eight, have to say eight. it if it's gonna if it's gonna make you. No, play. no, no. It's fine. Uh, back then, when people had, well, people still don't really know how to play stud eight all that well, but they're better now than they were then. It got capped every street. <laughs> I started two, three, four. I, call, I remember starting two, three, four suited. It gets capped on third. Only one ace is out. No fives are out. No sixes are out. It's an ace and a king are capping it. I catch the suited five. I have two, three, four, five. Uh, <laughs> I, the one thing I don't remember the story was what the suit was. You're open ended to a straight flush. I have an open and straight flush. No one ace out. No sixes. My draw. I remember my flush drop. There might have been one dead flush draw card. The ace and the king are doing all the capping. I catch an offsuit six. Catch Jid. I'm, I'm in the money seat. The ace and king are. I can't even get a raise. I can't even get a bet in. The ace's board reads something to the effect of ace jack nine, and the king has king xx. I'm like these guys must be rolled up. I mean, this is great. I mean, I don't have to do any work. They're just capping it for me. Yeah, you just sit there with the low at, at least. Yeah, I, I, I and the straight's the nuts. Sixth street, they catch they catch bricks. We get now. I start getting in the capping. Seventh street, I enjoy the. I get in the capping. Ace Jack Nine catches a third wheel card, or uh, catches a wheel card on Sixth Street. It makes a wheel on Seven. Oh man! He didn't have a three, three flush, four flush, nothing. Just a dry Ace, whatever two wheel cards he had. The King only had a pair of Kings on fourth, on third, fourth, and fifth. Makes Kings up on six, Kings full on seventh. <laughs> I remember slamming my hands so loud. I broke, I broke part of the thing on the chair. 
I, and this is why I thought online poker was rigged, and I, I like there's no, I got absolutely cheated. I had to have gotten cheated. It's not possible. This hand does not exist. That is the worst beat I've ever taken, and I've told anyone. Not talking about the money. No one has ever told me a worse beat than that. And not, it's not just the math behind. We're, we're, it's oh, the circumstances that you were dragged along. It's a circumstance. I don't even get a bet in. They have nothing. Yeah. A pair of kings and ace high. You're forced to. If so, in terms of the math and the uh, math and odds, it is the worst beat I've ever taken. No one's ever told me a worse beat. Than that. <laughs> it, I don't think a worse beat than that can exist. It's not possible. It doesn't. How does one person has nothing and is doing the cap? Because yeah, they both have, have to hit kings. perfect for you not to at least get half. Yeah. And you should be scooping most of the time. I'm scooping every time. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's amazing. That's and crazy. They're, we capped third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. <laughs> for that reason, if anybody can ever tell me a worse beat than that, it doesn't exist in No Limit Hold'em or Pat Limit Oma. I've seen where uh, two people get it on a 9 3 3 board and they run it twice, and the guy, and the guy with threes has like. And when one guy obviously has nines full, and one guy has uh, threes. He's got a three, two cards under a nine and a ten. I've seen the ten ten roll out and the case three on the other one. Mm-hmm. That's pretty awful. Uh, is that worse than mine? I don't think it is because mine got capped every street. Yeah. And the, the math on that is, in, is absurd for it to go ten ten <laughs> on one board and the case three on the other one. Perfect, uh, perfect, yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that's absurd. It's ridiculous. But in terms of max bets getting in and limit, I don't think there's worse than mine. No, it doesn't sound like there is. No, that that was just that was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. In poker. <laughs> uh, weirdest place you've ever played poker for money? Any sketchy home games? I'd or? say a poker room. Uh, no, uh, uh, no, uh, never played in any odd uh, home games. Uh, uh, just, like I said, when I was younger, I played in those charity events, and then once I started twenty three, twenty four, it was always casinos. Uh, I've gotten invited to a million home games over the years, and just. It never felt like it was something I was I was going to be completely comfortable with unless I had one or two really good friends there. And even when they did, I just, you know what, I'm fine. I'm comfortable. I don't want to yeah. go to anywhere. I did enough stretch in the, in these charity games. I, that's enough sketchiness for, for for one lifetime. I don't need any more. I, I'm comfortable playing uh, in casinos. Who's the best player we've never heard of? The best poker player you've never heard of. So obviously not a tournament player. Or it could just be a guy that doesn't get the credit he deserves. Or she. Best player. I mean, some of the best players are cash game players. Uh, the truth is that they'd rather keep their anonymity uh, by themselves. So I'm going to respect their privacy. Uh, these guys would just wipe the floors with, uh, the, with these tournament players. If they ever decide to play no tournaments, they'd be experts in five seconds. They're some of the best players you've so never. So you subscribe of. to the whole cash games? The overwhelming are yes. I don't get me wrong. These guys that play the no limit home super high rollers, the hundred Ks, and every every other week, they're phenomenal at what they do. They're great at one thing. I'm not saying they wouldn't be good if they put the time and effort into the other thing, but the, the majority of them are proven in one thing and only in a tournament format. Some of them wouldn't be good cash game players. Mm-hmm. They just wouldn't be. Uh, well, you see the Solver crew, you know, they're working on the numbers, staying balanced, uh, all that sort of stuff. It, it, is that, does that exist for mixed games? I'll say this. It's, it's unbelievable. The, I, I, the one thing I do respect with those guys, it is amazing all the work they've done. They've ran out a million charts. They've studied everything to a T. Um, and yet... They're phenomenal. They're all better than me. It's not by as big a margin. As th- if I played with them, I'm not going to be intimidated by any stretch. I'm absolutely an underdog. There's no question about it. I think it's a good margin. It's not a great size margin. Okay. But the margin between them and, and me playing mix is going to be night and day. Mm-hmm. It's not even close. And it's going to take them a while to adjust it. Good luck for trying to find a billion charts that exist for all these other games. You have to put in the time and effort. That's what I'm saying. It seems like mix games, the the, the software doesn't exist at that level yet. I'll tell you, I'll say this. At least when it comes to a couple of games, when you find the software exists, come play me. We'll still play. <laughs> it's not going to help you out in certain, certain spots. I mean, sure, you'll have a better idea of what to do. But, I mean, just come and just play and play cash. Go to Bellagio. Go to Commerce. Go to Borgata. Go down south to Florida. Do you have a favorite game? Uh... Uh, I've got a, a game that I think I'm best at. I don't know if I call it my favorite game. Uh, I mean, I think my best game is Seven Cards That High, which I think a lot of people would probably attest to. Um, it's nice when some of the best players in the world will come up to you and ask you about certain questions and in return. Yeah. You, you can get questions on every other game. So that, that's always, that's that, that's one cool thing. It's about. Do you have anybody uh, you can name drop? I'd rather not. I mean, with... you did name drop. Doyle gave you a nice compliment after you beat Todd Heads up. That that, that 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 was that was really cool. Actually, he came. I remember. Uh, he came up to me the following day, and uh, he said, "I just wanted to you know, just because my my rail got a little one guy in my rail got really drunk, which I was embarrassed by. So <laughs> I don't really speak to someone I don't really speak to anymore. Uh, but yeah, he's just, the way I thought I handled it, he thought I played really well. And I thought that was that was that was that was actually cool. Yeah. Uh, when Doyle came Doyle came up to me afterwards, 
Uh, but yeah, I, I like I said in general, I think most people prefer to be on the railroad. They, they don't really want their name spoken, and I get it. I mean, you know, when I'm not playing tournaments, I don't really, uh, you know, I, I don't prefer to talk about really how I do. I mean, when people ask me, I'm like, you know, it's like if someone asks you, hey, by the way, what's your salary? <laughs> you know, sometimes I win, sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. I mean, I've had losing years in poker. I've had, a, you know, a break even year. But like I said, I hope it's, I don't want to hold it down to it. I'm good with how I manage my money, so when the bad times happen, uh, it's not going to affect me really that much. It's going to affect a lot of other players. Yeah, that's true. Uh, what was your largest non-poker wager? Uh, you mentioned three hundred bucks on, well, a, on I'll, a tennis I'll you, match. I'll tell you this. So, <laughs> uh, Biggie's going to hate this story, but this is a funny story. I don't know if it's a big. Again, I've never really wagered all that much. So we order a UFC fight package uh, like five six years ago. I think it might have been George St. Pierre's last uh, fight, or at the time. I think he fought one John, of his announced yeah, fighters. Johnny Hendricks or something or whatever in the main event. So we keep it, we keep it fun. We we we're watching all dozen fights. There's about five six guys at his house, and we start betting. I think five bucks on the first fight or whatever, and <clears throat> we'll lose the first fight. And we're, we're whatever the odds are, whoever's you know whoever you know we're just, every other one can pick the fight. I lose the first like literally 11, 12, 13 fights on the card. It, it's absurd. <laughs> I'm stuck. <coughs> I'm stuck about six, seven hundred dollars. I'm like, he's laughing. He thinks it's the greatest thing ever. So the last fight comes up, and I and I got the option to pick. I decided to take GSP, and uh, he was a favorite. Uh, I I don't even remember what I was laying a buck eighty or minus two twenty, which my as people told me, don't ever lay that. You just can't win. But at this point, I'm, I'm just taking the best fighter. I'm already stuck. Who cares if I lose another? Uh, you needed to book a win. Yeah. So the fight happens. And I don't know how many people remember this fight. And I'm not a big UFC fan uh, anymore. Or I mean, I, I am, but I don't go out of my way to watch it like I used to when I was younger. GSP gets his butt whipped. I mean, it's blatantly obvious. Like he, in my opinion, lost three. He probably lost the fourth round. Fourth round, I think he's. I think he lost four or five rounds. The fourth, I thought was questionable. But I, I, and he's like, oh my god, it was clear cut. Oh, it was clear cut. Everybody who watched that fight knew knew he lost. And uh, I think if I remember correctly, I think that would have came to about th- twelve hundred and change or thirteen hundred change, whatever it was. I said, tell you what, let me keep the change before the announcement comes up, and uh, just keep twelve thirteen hundred. I'm just looking to save literally forty dollars on twelve thirteen hundred. That's how much drawn debt I thought I was. So we're talking forty dollars on twelve hundred, which is like what three percent? Yeah, literally. Tiny. Three, I'm literally trying to save that forty dollars. He's like, oh, I'm, but I'm punishing you for this whole thing. That he came out that he won the fight. Oh my god! I laugh. I can never go laughing so much in my life. Biggie was so sick over the result of this. It was the greatest thing ever. Uh, just seeing his result. It's one of the best nights of sleep I've ever had in my entire life. I just just know the tor- torture he went through just to not give me forty dollars was the greatest day, the greatest thing ever. That's hilarious. I've never been so happy in my life uh, just to see the torture he can go through because being we get joy out of certain tortures we've given each other over the years. But like, he's my best friend in poker, one of my best friends. Period. But that will always that is one of the stories that will always stay at night with me. And it, just the fact that he should have tor- taken me for about twelve thirteen hundred dollars, and I laughed. I took the twenty minute fifteen twenty minute drive home. I went to bed. What a I comeback. slept seven, eight hours. I woke up the following day with a smile on my face for the next, like, week. <laughs> uh, do you wear headphones at the table? Occasionally. Uh, and when you do, what are you listening to? Anything. Uh, listen to the Beatles station a lot on Sirius XM. Uh, 90, about 98% of the time I'm listening to Sirius XM or something. Listen to either, uh, you know, still listen to 90s Grunge, which is still my favorite. Uh, listen to... Alt uh, Alt Network or, one, uh, or uh, uh, what's the other station I listen to? I'm drawing a blank. And then I listen to Howard Stern still all the time to stay. The show's better than it's ever been. So you want to shout out? Howard, thanks for being better now than you've ever been. The show's yeah, the he greatest. definitely listens to poker stories. Yeah. Uh, oh, exactly. <laughs> oh, if Howard, like you said, I mean, I love being on your show, but if Howard wants to get me on too, Howard would love to talk to I, 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 it's the show. If, it's the greatest show. If this show, show gets you on Howard Stern, I'm taking full credit. You, I will 100% give you full credit on everything. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, I love listening. It's still one of the few things that, may, that truly makes me laugh every time I listen to it. The stories are fantastic. Yeah, I've never been a Stern guy, but I've been hearing it his name a lot lately. You can't believe how everyone loves the, him. The lately. show's not like it was in the 90s where all it was was profanity nonstop or. Uh, you know, naked women every five seconds on the show. It is so good the comedy to a T. Now it's so much better than the show's ever been. Uh, I highly recommend. It. If you get back to it, I think you won't stop. Yeah, uh, but that's yeah. what I'm worried about. Yeah, well, uh, it's great to listen when you're driving too. So, but yeah, th- 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 that's for the most part uh, what, what I listen. To, what I listen well, to. Well, you heard, you heard him, folks. After you've listened to every episode of Poker Stories, try to fit that new guy Howard Stern in. Yeah, he's gonna make <laughs> it. He's gonna make it one day. He's 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 got promise. Yeah. Uh, you no, know, what kind of music you listen to? Uh, what's your favorite album? 
all-time favorite album to this day is still Nevermind uh, from Nirvana. I think all 12 songs, top to bottom, are as good as it gets. Uh, any Beatles album, doesn't matter. Sgt. Pepper, Rubber Soul, The White Album, Abbey Road. Uh, have you uh, have you talked with Steve Albini at all? The, revol- the Revolver. Uh, I want to talk. I want to talk about uh, when he made uh, uh, the uh, uh, Journal playing the follow up album to Nevermind. Uh, uh, oh, wow, that's 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 embarrassing. My favorite band. I'm drawing a blank on their. Uh, you want? Well, here's what we'll do. I'll look it up. And then oh, it's so embarrassing. I can't think. You of it, can. Uh, uh, we'll edit it in cleanly where you just knew it for the whole time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I know what you're talking about because I just I just watched the. Foo Fighters documentary where he was yeah. interviewed um, and uh, they talked about how he did the second one it's uh, in, the, in utero in utero gosh that's embarrassing to know that that uh, both unplugged and then the Foo Fighters are one of my other favorite bands but yeah in terms of I think Led Zeppelin 4 is one of the greatest masterpieces ever mm-hmm. um, basically every Led Zeppelin um, Led Zeppelin 2 uh, House of the Holy uh, Physical Graffiti Led Zeppelin one. I think that has arguably the greatest cover song of all time <laughs> uh, on there from Joan Baez, "Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You." Uh, I think I might. I mean, you can make a list of all the all time. That's how that song's never mentioned is just insane to me. I think it's when you hear Robert Plant just go full blown. Uh, it's it's absurd. It's like wow, that's what Joan Baez. When you hear Joan Baez's version, that's, you're not hearing any of that. But it's it's just it's, on Led Zeppelin one. It's so good. Uh, but yeah, it's I, I probably it's more favorite groups than. Uh, then albums in particular, like I said, my all-time favorite, you know, like I said, uh, Nirvana, The Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Queen, you, Alice you, in uh, Chains. You got some time span there. You, you don't, you yeah. said 90s, but that's, you go on well, everywhere. Well, yeah, all early, early, early 90s, Soundgarden, Alice Chains, Pearl Jam, that'll always be my absolute favorite, uh, like Mud Honey. I love all those groups. Uh, that's my absolute favorite, but like I said, then for, that's probably a lot of 60s stuff and some early 70s rock. Uh, like some, you know, parents who, influence? Who, who, no, no, not at all. Uh, like, who doesn't love the Rolling Stones? Uh, in terms of parents, I still remember my mom. The two, the two things she'd play above all else were the Beach Boys and Whitney Houston. <laughs> and my dad, big Creedence Clearwater Revival fan, and I love CCR. I think "Who'll Stop the Rain" is one of the greatest songs ever. Um, you know, their songs are just classic, nonstop. And you know, I, I love listening to the Doors. Uh, they're just terrific. Uh, uh, Bob Seger. Uh, yeah, I, I'm all over the place, and of course, I mean, and I, and for three years in a row, I went as Elvis uh, uh, f- uh, for uh, for Halloween three years in a row. <laughs> yeah. You just have one costume? No, no uh, I don't know if I still have that costume or not. Uh, I don't think I do, but yeah, I loved going as Elvis uh, uh, for Halloween. I mean, I think he's the greatest. As much as everyone loves Michael Jackson or Prince, Elvis is the king. The one's called the king of a genre. One's the king. Yeah. Sorry. The king and, of pop and, versus and, the and, king. Yeah, yeah. One's the king of one's uh, yeah. One's the king of a genre. The other's called a prince, and the other's called a king. <laughs> you two can bow down to Elvis at any time you want. What does Queen fit in there? <laughs> <laughs> Queen's great. I yeah. mean, the, the Queen can match with Elvis. There I mean, you go. And it, it's you know, I, I find it amazing. So when uh, Bohemian Rap, I find it amazing because of the, when the movie Bohemian Rhapsody comes out, it came out a year ago. Mm-hmm. How did people not know any half these songs exist, existed? Right. It's scary how good their music is. And like the one thing about Queen, more so than maybe than every other group that ever existed, no two songs are alike. Like mm-hmm. if you listen like, to the Four Tops, every song sounds alike. I mean, it's good, but they all sound like every single song is Queen different. Queen has than the eras. Next. I'm where you saying? could Queen has eras where you could be like, oh, that was a uh, psychedelic Queen era, yeah, you know, or that was the era where they were relying on their guitars a little more. Exactly. It's it's. Oh, it's, this is Freddie doing opera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Night at the Opera. I mean, that's one of the greatest albums ever. I mean, it's, I mean, music's great. It's one of the few things that you can always listen to. It should always get you in some sort of good mood, one way or the other. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, I listen to just about all music, uh, ex- probably except for country. Which I, I I wish I could appreciate more than I do. I, I just I've never been able to. Uh, get around to it. I mean, it's I do a very like some Johnny politically Cash. Politically correct about... answer. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not even politically correct. I, I genu, I genuinely wish I could, I can appreciate it. I, I just, can't, I can't get over uh, some. I, I wish I could. We end the podcast the same way every time with a question from the random question generator. All right. You ready? Sure. 
How likely do you think it will be that humans will last another thousand years without killing ourselves off? Oh, we're, we're drawing dead. We <laughs> have no say, shot. Can we update this question from well, a thousand? Oh, uh, that's not true. According to President Trump, there's no such thing as anything that's going on. And he knows more about anything, about everything than anyone that ever lived. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to listen to our president. And if you can see my oh, my eyes rolling in the back of my head right now. They're facing the other way. <laughs> oh, is that, yeah, they, they, really, they really are. It, it's, it's literally like Bugs Bunny or, or Daffy Duck. <laughs> you spin your head around. Uh, no, uh, I well, think I mean, it, it doesn't specify climate change. We could it doesn't nuke, ma- we could it doesn't nuke matter. ourselves. It doesn't too. matter what. Yeah, climate, nuclear. The truth is, I think we're in a lot. Of, I think we're in for a world of hurt eventually. Probably not in our lifetime. Our kids are grandkids. I don't think we're going to be around a, a thousand. Well, that makes now. me feel good. Well, I mean, at least it won't affect I mean, truth me. Is, I mean, <laughs> when dinosaurs roam the earth, I mean, eventually everything evolves in life. Dinosaurs roam the earth, and eventually they became extinct. Humans are no different. Maybe we're more intelligent, but maybe we're too intelligent for them. Well. Individuals are intelligent. People on the whole are not. Mm-hmm. That's just. I remember hearing that quote when I was like 12, 13 years old, and that quote's proven to be true to this day. Uh, when people get together, just more bad than good can really happen on the whole, and it's terrible. That's where we're at. And like I said, egos get involved, and so many other uh, factors that that occur. But yeah, I think eventually we're going to kill ourselves off. Whether it's nuking, cli- we're not doing anything about climate change, uh, just the ocean just taking up more of our land. It's you know deforestation. Everything eventually is going to accumulate into something. Uh, and eventually when it starts to be less to go around, wars will develop. And the more wars will come because we need to get this little thing that's left that's actually safe for people. And more people will end up dying that way. I, I would I would generally be surprised if we're in a thousand years from now. And truth is, another species will eventually uh, uh, evolve as a result of us being extinct. Um, I mean, hopefully it's more than a thousand years. But right, people we'll say it's the, the Earth's not doomed. Humans are doomed. The yeah. Earth will move on without us and yeah, just I mean, be different, different. Yeah, dinosaurs kill themselves. We're no different. We're no different as species. So not a thousand. How many years we got left? I I couldn't even put a number on it. I I would take the under on a thousand. Good thing I don't have to prop bet this thing out and find out. No, people are going to come back and listen to this and mock you when you're wrong. They, well, you're you're right because you know what's going to happen. I mean, we're probably we're probably never going to die eventually. It's going to it's going to be tuck ever it's going to be tuck everlasting. We're going to live forever eventually. Uh, we're gonna eat, we're gonna eat the right. What what, what was it in that book? Was it an apple? I forget what it was. I don't they remember. ate an apple or something they had to eat, and next thing they live forever. Uh, which I don't think anybody would want either. Uh, I drank from the Fountain of Youth when I was a kid. It shows. I know. I took a, I took a nice trip up uh, in Florida. Um, it hasn't stopped the aging process or the joints from hurting, but I'm pretty sure I'm immortal. So You probably are. Yeah. I wouldn't tell anybody because... Ponce de Leon told me. <laughs> that's a good reference. No, that's... Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I'd, keep that, I'd keep that in the lowdown. I wouldn't want many people knowing because I'll... Don't you, test it. Do you want to see some of these people around two, three, four, five hundred years from now? No. You, at least this way, you got to keep it fresh. You know, every fifty, sixty years. Let's recycle these. You people. know, like I said, you got, you know, you got, you know, your wife and you know, you know, and the, your offspring right now. But eventually, you know, another hundred years, you know, hundred, two hundred. Oh, let me go get a new, get a new, new kids, new family, new everything. There you go. And just keep going on. Hopefully, reincarnation's real. Uh, hopefully I, not. I don't, I don't know. If, I don't know. If I want that to be real. Hopefully but, not. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't think. Uh, I'll be good with a good eighty. I'll be good with a good eighty, ninety years, and I'll be good to go. Or some wood, so we can knock on it. Yeah. Uh, is there? Oh, there we go. There we go. Oh, Adam, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. That was great. I, I, I'm glad you had me. I appreciate it. That's it. That's the show. Thank you once again to Adam for coming on and sharing his story. Uh, you can see his progress as he goes for bracelet number four by following him on Twitter, at AdamFriedman119. Uh, you can follow us at Card Player Media or Poker underscore Stories. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe and get a brand new Poker Stories episode every two weeks. A big thank you to those who left a rating and a review last week. It really helps us out when you do that. You can also send your questions and comments to pokerstories at cardplayer.com. Thanks for listening.